Good morning and welcome to the House Committee on Environment and Energy. This morning, we're gonna continue talking about the Renewable Energy Standard. And we are going to start by hearing from Andrea Cohen, the Manager of Government Affairs at the Vermont Electric Co-op. Welcome. Hey, I'll try to share the screen. See, there's my slide. There we go. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Um, I am going to share some slides, and I know we don't have lots of time, so I'll go kind of quick and happy to come back uh, if we want to dive into anything you know more detail. But just to remind you, Vermont Electric Co-op. Uh, is a member-owned nonprofit cooperative uh, utility in the state. And you could see on this, oh, let me see if I could get bigger here. You could see on this um, map, the pink towns on the top, and uh, that's our service territory. We go um, from the west side of the islands uh, through uh, Franklin County, Lamoille County, over to Essex Orleans on the east side. So the whole northern tier. And a few things about VEC to just share. Uh, we're the second largest utility in the state. Um, and our demographic is interesting and I think relevant to this conversation. We have an older um, membership. Our members, almost half of them are over age 65. A lot of what I'm gonna talk about today is the cost of providing safe, clean, reliable service and why as it relates to this res bill, some of the things you'll be hearing from us as you actually get into looking at language and uh, consider all the provisions in there. I will say we, um, my boss, Rebecca Town, was a participant in the study committee this summer. And um, the reason, you know, we're, and, and this is a very sensitive balance of things. There's things in there that we feel are important and things that are a little bit of maybe a cost pressure, but as a package overall, it's something at this point we're we're participating in and want to help see happen. Um, but of course, once you get into language and things like that, we might have different things to say depending on what you're considering. Um, again, it, it all goes back to our members. Um, we have a pretty low income um, demographic and you'll see, I don't know if you're familiar with the energy burden report that Efficiency Vermont puts out, but uh, you sh it's something to learn more about. It's fascinating and important uh, when it comes to energy equity. Uh, when we look at the most recent report, we see that out of the top 10 towns with the largest energy burden, six of those are VEC members and the next one's a VEC member. So we talk a lot about cost and getting good value for the investments we're putting in our electrical system. Uh, and you'll hear us nonstop talk about that, frankly. Can you, we, excuse me, yeah. say one more time for me. It helps to know like how many towns you serve. And... Yeah, uh, we have 78 towns. 78 towns. Right. And as you saw from that first map, a lot of them are little, smaller towns. And there's places where more than one utility is in a town, um, VEC, and you'll see co-ops generally. <laughs> Uh, the history is we we ended up picking up where it was uneconomic for people to do it. So we're kind of not in the villages, you know, we're in the rural parts of those towns. So we like to joke, we do Mountain View Road, <laughs> you know, we're always kind of out there. So uh, the number of meters per mile, you know, is a lot less than maybe some of the other utilities. That little piece of history is, I think, worth just sitting with for a second. You ended up picking up where the others wouldn't, and not unlike your world, the right? Now, the CUD, <laughs> right? Yeah. So Similar. I think that is important for us to remember. Yeah, we were formed in 1938, you know. and it was because the farmers were like, "We'd like to get some power out here where nobody else is serving." Yeah, very similar. Um, we survey our members every year. Over 1,200 members. It's statistically significant. This is the past few years just on a chart, and you'll see the low cost of energy is the most important thing to our members. Uh, not to say they don't care about renewable energy and carbon free, but we always have our eye on the cost. And if you break that data down, you'll see the lower income folks care more than the, you know, it's obvious, but we actually can see that, you know, cost of energy is particularly relevant to the lower income folks in our membership. Um, and you'll have these if you want to dig in. Like I said, we have a lot of data. So our priorities are we have multiple priorities. It needs to be safe. It has to be affordable. It has to be reliable. It has to be clean and equitable. And so we're always balancing all these things. It's never just one of those things. 
Um, and, you know, to get to some of what you're working on, on the renewable energy standard, uh, this is, you're not going to read the little numbers down below, but just an example, there's a lot of ways to get renewable energy on our system. Some are much more expensive than others. You will hear us often come in to say, why should we pay more when we could get renewable energy for less money? Again, because we have other things we're trying to do, keep the lights on, not raise rates more than we need to. Um, so a lot of times you'll hear us bring up, uh, and these are just two examples. This is a chart DPS put together. On the far right, if you go out and you competitively bid for solar, you can get a much less expensive thing than, say, net metering. So that other arrow is current net metering, almost half the price, right? Some of it's scale, some of it said you're going competitive net metering, as you may be aware, is like there's nothing you can negotiate. It's set. We have to pay that much. We don't get to negotiate about that. Representative Stubbins. Yeah, um, you touched on this, Andrea, and good morning. Good morning. Um, uh, I, I just, for the committee, just so they know, uh, the far right standard offer, that's like a two megawatt size plant. Um, so. That is definitely, yes, it's competitively bid, but it's also, you know, you're talking about a very big difference of scale and you touched upon that, but I think two megawatts to like comparison to a 10 kW is, is a big difference. And so those aren't like homeowners. So thank you for that clarification. So what we do as a nonprofit co-op is we do these competitively bid community solar on behalf of all of our members. So it's not just those that net meter, but we procure this and put this on the system. So you don't necessarily need to do the one on your own house. I mean, if you want to, fine, but you don't need to because we're procuring renewable energy for everybody at this larger scale, as you're saying. So great, great segue into our community solar. So there's a lot of ways to do solar. Uh, VEC for the past eight, 10 years has done community scale projects. Uh, it's our VEC community solar project. They're comparing different ways to bring solar on the system. We find this to be very cost effective. As you just saw, uh, we get to control where the siting is. So we put it in locations that are efficient on the grid. Um, it's local renewable energy. Uh, the recs get retired. It's very inclusive. So if you're a renter and you don't have a good site, you know, to put solar or, you know, any of those things, you're still benefiting from the solar we're putting on the system, and uh, that brings the energy equity. Um, can't see the bottom. Let me see if I can move that. Yeah, and it's affordable. We we offer financing options on that. Um, so we're really proud of the community solar program. We think it's a great model. Why can't I advance my slide? There we go. So uh, this is an example of uh, three of the projects we've done, larger than net metering, absolutely, but. Um, the Alberg one is about one megawatt. The Grand Isle on the far right is five and the Heinsberg is 1.3. So we've done projects at that scale. And uh, we we do that on behalf of all of our members, but we do offer uh, members the opportunity to sponsor panels if they like. That community solar program was kind of the model for something new and exciting that I wanted to share about to launch in partnership with WEC. We uh, were able to secure dollars Thank you all uh, through the Affordable Community um, Solar Program and um, you all uh, appropriated $10 million of ARPA dollars for this to do community scale solar for income qualified folks. We are super excited, like we just signed the grant agreement and about to launch in a week or two. And what we're gonna be able to do is use another lamp, another solar project that. Uh, our partners at, with Encore Renewables, they've been a partner for a lot of our projects. They've been amazing. Um, we have this project in Jericho Landfill that was a uh, year and a half ago opened that we'll be using for this. And essentially the grant will be used to provide income qualified folks the ability to sponsor panels. And how we design this one is those folks um, will be able to get a $45 a month bill credit every month for five years, bringing real dollars to people that really could use that help. Uh, phase one, which is the Jericho Landfill Project, uh, VEC will be able to enroll 365 of our members in that. WEC will be able to enroll 115. 
There's a phase two potential. We have a great, so this is $1.2 million directly to people for their bills. Like we're so excited about this. Um, phase two, we're looking at other projects, other potential new renewables. Uh, so we're working with partners now to see what we can do for that. And if we get phase two, per, you know, permitted and going, we'll, we have more money on phase two of the grant to do more. So this is the model that we see is how to support low income Vermonters in terms of supporting renewable energy, bringing more renewable energy in the system in a very cost effective way, not paying more than we need to paying, you know, competitive prices for that. So um, that was my last slide. I just wanted to put that out there to say, we see this as the model for how we can really move forward in a way where support goes to the people that need it most. I, uh, um, one thing I just, I've noticed is that you seem to have maybe a, and this is typical perhaps of many jurisdictions in Vermont, um, bifurcated, you know, you said your average household income was 72,000, 77,000? 75, yeah. Um, and yet you have six of the top 10 most energy burdened communities. So that's a, that's a big, so you must, you know, I'm seeing that you probably have a lot of wealthy retirees, perhaps, and then um, lower income folks. We have some second homeowners, you know, we have the islands and some other places. So the, the average is, the average. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. That was helpful. Do members have questions? Representative Tory. Do you have a low income assistance bill pay? We do not. And we've worked, there's a lot of dockets at the PUC regarding this. Our problem with just VEC having one is who, there's not enough, like so many people <laughs> qualify. So how do, who do we, you know, pull from to support, like, so as we talk about that, what we've said to the PC is uh, maybe think about a statewide kind of pro approach to this because we couldn't do it at BEC just on our own. I'm sorry, you couldn't do what I missed. Let's do like a low income rate. Oh, yeah. That's been talked about and we've looked at that and just because we have so many fixed income people that would need, need to receive support, there's not enough there. So maybe statewide is, a, is worth looking at this. Yes. Representative Sibelian and Stubbings. I know we have a bunch of witnesses and not a ton of time, but if you could just uh, for a moment kind of talk about <clears throat> one of our rural utilities, really like what are your priorities this year, you know, last year, like what are the things that are top of mind for our rural utilities, our CUD equivalents, right? <laughs> I neglected to mention we've already, our board is already committed to 100% renewable and 100% carbon free. I'll just put that out there and in a way that we could do that cost effectively. Our mo you know, we're coming off of two storms, 58 broken poles, mm -hmm. 30,000 plus outages that we've restored in five days. And we think we're doing a great job. It's actually it was two storm Elliot's that we cleaned up in the same period of time. So, our crews are amazing and they're exhausted. And the dollars, like those broken poles, that's like a half a day job and special equipment. And, you know, like, so in terms of, you know, we need to keep the lights on, especially for rural lower income folks who, you know, don't have maybe the means to buy a generator, don't have, you know, like, so our, you know, we're laser focused on like keeping the lights on for those people that need, that rely on us for that. Uh, that's our priority. I mean, cyber is another thing, like cyber threats are not going away. We have been investing more and more in that, and that's going to need more investment and smarter people, you know, who who want to make sure that our system's secure. So I'd say those two things are absolutely the highest priority for us. And we believe we could still do clean energy like we have committed. But I think the part of that is let us do it in the way that we need to do it so that we're not paying more than we need to. So we have money for these other things. Thanks so much. Yeah. Um, and actually I want to ask, Will, <clears throat> we, we ended up just with more folks in this slot than we originally anticipated. And I don't want you all to feel this time pressure because I think if you could reach out to the next witnesses, Chris Cochran and Jacob and see if they 
could start at 11 and then we'll have more time and people will feel like we can have these questions answered that we need answered. Representative Stebbins. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, there is H668, the Low Income Electric Ratepayer Protection Act on our wall that I'd, I'd love to hear your feedback. It is a state approach. It's a starting point. I don't necessarily, you know, it's, it's really because I think it is too challenging to address this individually. Um, but I think it's something that we need to start talking about figuring out a plan. I haven't read it. I'm happy to, um, you know, yeah, not, yeah. not now. Not yeah. now. Just our, low, our low income strategy, gen, you know, starts with just keeping costs down as much as we can, right? Because that benefits everyone. Because wherever you put the line, there's somebody just over the line. You know, somebody income qualifies and then that next person didn't. Uh, so we try to keep costs down for everybody. But if there's creative ideas about, you know. Yeah, I'll just be interested yeah, in the feedback. Yeah, because, you know, it's regressive, right? Anybody who you know, electric bill for a hundred dollars, depending on your income, that's where the energy burden report is fascinating and right. really helpful because it's, it's like larger percentage of your overall. Right. Yeah. Right. And that's important because yep. we hear sometimes people like, Oh, it's just a few bucks. Well, we have people that come to our office to negotiate payment arrangements because just a few bucks really makes a difference. Like we turn people's power off if they don't pay their bill eventually. Right. Yep. And there's a lot of supports and we direct them and we work with them and it's not, we take no pleasure in that, but um, you know, people literally are like on payment plans for $10 a week for the next four weeks. And, you know, so, you know, so, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so it's heartbreaking. So those few dollars do make a difference. And so we just try our best to keep the cost down as much as we can. Further questions, Andrea? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Morris. I have two short ones. I think I think they're short. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Andrea, what what do you attribute the uh, the reason for the uh, six of the top ten communities in my, and you also hold number eleven um, the high the high burden cost? So what 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 do you attribute yeah. that to? Um, Efficiency Vermont could come in and speak to how they come up with all that, but it's both your income. And your cost of energy. So it's income. Really. Right. So income really drives a lot of that. I mean, different utilities have different costs. We're not so out of whack with everybody that it's like, wow, your rates are crazy. It's just more, I think, the income. Income. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. And, then and it's whole energy. So it's, it's, it's heating, it's transportation. That, that number I gave you, they also break it down by just electrical or transport. It's it's fascinating report worth taking a look at. Thank you for that. My second question is, I'm just curious about the, uh, the low income payback, uh, $45 a month for five years. Uh, is there an initial cost for to enter into that or is it just no. the credit? This will just be, it's, there's no, there's no entry fee for that. It is just designed to help people support, support renewable energy and get a bill credit through the ARPA dollars that are just going to make their way through to them. And uh, WEC and ourselves, we basically have, you know, we're not taking much, you know, admin or anything. We're really trying to pass through as much as we can. So most of the grant is going right out to people. Thank you. Yeah. All right, it has to be short. We don't have, okay. now we don't have forever with each witness either. Okay. <laughs> this is a quick question. I could also ask uh, Lewis the same one. I'm curious about your um, access to some of the federal dollars. Um, are you are you able to access those dollars? Do you have the, your, the resources to even apply and yeah we've been applying for things um like this one was a little easier because it came through dps and they you know um lewis might be able you're probably a little closer to some of the infrastructure types of grants uh we've been part of a few applications not everything has worked out you know it's a tremendous amount of time as you might imagine to that so we're a little limited in our ability to jump on everything Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony. Next up, we have Kathy Byer from Evernorth. And so we have about 10 to 15 minutes each. So keep that in mind. Thanks. Good morning. I'm uh, Kathy Byer. I'm from uh, Evernorth. We um, build and own affordable rental housing across the state of Vermont in partnership with um, many of our regional nonprofits that I'm sure many of you are um, aware of. I need to figure out how to share my screen. Oh. Um, uh, 
All right, does it work? Thanks. I'm really glad I got to hear Andrea's presentation um, because I'm here to talk about, she touched about on net metering and that's what I'm here to talk about today. But I'm really here to talk about a subset of what she was talking about. I'm talking about net metering for um, low and moderate income renters, which is a very different population than homeowners. Um, and I'd like to use um, an example of a, a affordable housing development that Champlain Housing Trust and Evernorth hope to have under construction in May. It's um, 68 uh, apartments um, located in, a, um, um, it's gonna be a mixed income neighborhood. It's located right off Shelburne Road. If those of you who know that corridor, it's very close to the Automaster. And it also includes uh, 26 shared equity homes. So um, the, um, and here's the site plan, the rental housing is on, is to the right and the shared equity homes are to the left. Um, Evernorth and Champlain Housing Trust are committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions in our buildings. And what we do is we build very high performance buildings and at Bay Ridge, um, we'll be using cold, cold climate heat pumps. And in this way, Bay Ridge Apartments addresses climate change by reducing the use of fossil fuels and therefore reducing our carbon emissions by 189 tons per year. However, the choice to electrify our building means the operating cost at Bay Ridge will be higher than if we had stayed with natural gas. Yes. And um, higher operating costs make it more challenging to keep, our, um, to keep our rents affordable. Therefore, adding solar to Bay Ridge apartments <clears throat> is critical to the long-term sustainability of our property. Before solar, the estimated annual um, electric costs are $108,000 a year. And um, that does not include the added cost of maintaining heat pumps, which are, have a higher maintenance um, operating cost than standard natural. If Bay Ridge used, here's an here's elevation, I wanted you to get an idea for the new construction buildings, and as you'll see, we had planned for a flat roof. Part of the reason we need the flat roof, however, is that the compressors for the heat pumps have to be located on the roof. So um, we then worked with, uh, to get a plan for how many panels we could get on the roof. And here you'll see, this is what is in our construction documents. And working with this uh, rooftop solar plan, we can only offset 15% of our electric load um, with what's on the rooftop. And this is typical in a multifamily rental building. We have more people per square foot we have less roof space to deal with, and particularly compared to a single family home where you can often offset almost 100% of your load. Um, we just have, we house more people per square foot. It's actually a very, from an energy efficiency perspective, it's a very energy efficient building per person living per square foot. There's another way to say that, but that's the way I say it. So offsite net metered solar and I'm not gonna use the word community solar because we're really talking about net metered solar to Bay Ridge apartments is needed to advance both the climate related electrification goals and our affordable housing goals at Bay Ridge. So we looked to a parcel right across the road, right across Route 7, and a parcel that's owned by Champlain Housing Trust. And um, they purchased this parcel. It was it, the days in parcel and they are now housing uh, they have supportive housing for the homeless population in the um, former hotel building. And behind that parcel was excess land that is not, can you cannot add additional residential development back there. And it's a very good location for um, 150 kilowatt solar PV um, array. And by combining the rooftop solar and this so-called offsite solar, uh, we now will be able to offset 51% of our electric load. Uh, there's no middleman in this transaction. The owner of the rental housing will also be the owner of the solar array. Our goal is to drive uh, all of the benefit of the net meter credits to the uh, building that's serving low and moderate income renters. And we are able to use um, the new incentives under the Inflation Reduction Act one of them that's in place now is the investment tax credit, which is a 
at base level is at 30%, but at Bay Ridge, it qualifies for the low income boost. And we can get a 50% tax credit for Bay Ridge apartments. That's a federal tax credit. It's actually a national competition. If Vermont doesn't, if Vermont um, developers uh, don't make an application for these, this boost, it's gonna go elsewhere. Um, so we are very, we haven't heard yet on that application, um, but we're very, very hopeful that we will get a, that approved by Treasury. We have a question from Representative Stevens. Yeah. Thanks, Archer. Sure. So, right, this is the Solar for All uh, program? No, no, the investment tax credit is a different tranche mm -hmm. than Solar for All. Okay. Yep. Uh, the investment tax credit has more time to it, number of years, like how many years? Uh, you caught me. I've, it does phase out. The boost does phase out after five or 10 years, but I'm not exact. Okay. Um, I'll hold the rest of my questions for now. It, but as you said, Solar for All would be another um, uh, stream of federal money that could be used for a project like this. Um, so why is this important? Um, the lowest income Vermonters live in rental housing. And historically, the benefits of PV have gone to higher income single family homeowners. And renters have had almost no access to the benefits of solar. And I found this statistic um, recently, and I think it's a little disturbing nationally, and I'm, I, I think this is close to what is the case in Vermont, only 2% of the solar capacity is benefiting LMI communities. Um, but here we are, the Inflation Reduction Act is presenting an enormous opportunity to change this. But we, as affordable housing developers, believe that we still need to have this tool of net metered solar in order to have a meaningful way to get the benefit of solar to our buildings. It's a tool that's used broadly in other states. The statistics said there's 2,500 community solar projects across 43 states. Um, and we, think that we can be, I, I, that slide that Andrea showed of the, um, the cost of net metering, which, you know, used to be at 23 cents at Bay Ridge, we will be getting 15 cents. Um, I understand the rate, the, the cost shift across rate pairs, but what we are proposing is a, is a pretty small subset and it is directly connected to LMI renters. So, um, there's, there just hasn't been a way to do this in the past and why, and it's why we think it's very important to hopefully keep this, um, tool in place. And it happens right at the time we're trying to electrify our buildings. I mean, it's like the perfect storm, right? We're, we're, we want to address climate change as affordable housing developers, but we also have a housing crisis. So if we electrify our buildings, we have got to be able to connect them to solar, um, We've been working with um, BHFA and uh, BHFA has been working the, with the public service department on the solar for all application that's gone in, I believe in March, um, they're gonna hear if um, they apply for a hundred million, I believe um, the, the concept is that 40 million would be administered by BHFA and part of that program, part of that money would be used for net meter, offsite net metered solar to affordable housing. Um, so I think it's a very unique moment in time as you consider this um, res update, as we talk about the value and cost of net metering as our affordable housing is in transition to electrification. Um, and as, as the Inflation Reduction Act, we're really, we're really on the beginning of when we're gonna be able to get our, um, get those dollars implemented and, and assist in our um, clean energy transition. I will stop there. Representative Sibelia. Thanks. Thanks for your testimony, Kathy, and thanks for your work um, on housing. Uh, I have a couple of questions, actually. Um, and uh, the first one is, um, help me understand <clears throat> how the benefit uh, gets to the individual tenant between uh, either the single meter 
net metering, which looks like a benefit to the developer versus community solar, which looks like a bill credit on an individual customer's bill? It's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> affordable housing um, owners across the state have chosen not to use the split incentive approach where the um, tenants pay for their heat uh, and hot water. In all of our buildings, the um, owner of the building pays for heat and hot water. And, in, and when we are able to connect our buildings um, to solar, we even, and particularly in senior housing, we also take on what's called the plug load of the apartment so that the tenant will have a zero electric bill. If, if you wanna get the solar benefit to our tenants meter, our tenants are only paying 30 to $40 a month in electric bills and $20, probably $22 a month is the meter charge. You can't get rid of the meter charge. So there's there, the, the $45 that Andrea was talking about a benefit, uh, renters in our buildings don't have that much of an electric bill to be credited to. So I know you were use the word developers, I, Evernorth is a developer, but we also are owners of these buildings that sign long-term affordability covenants and you know, ceilings here today. We, in perpetuity, agree that we will rent to this level of, um, this level of incomes and that the rents will stay affordable. So really, that's how we get the benefit to the res to the tenant is that we're able to sustain that building over time. Um, and so as you're, as you know, this, uh, there's a, a group that's working group that has been working and um, they've agreed on some uh, proposed updates to um, the renewable energy standard. And one of those um, in this tentative agreement that this we'll have to weigh in on is getting rid of group net metering. And so uh, a failure to do that may cause us not to be able to update the rest. So what I wanna understand is, help me understand what happens uh, in terms of the number of units you're able to bring online if group net metering goes away forever. So how would that have affected you know, your last project? that you used group, group net metering on? What was that project and how would it have affected it? You have to follow the breadcrumbs, but let's use Bay Ridge Apartments. If we can't, if we were not able to do the offsite 150 kilowatt solar system, then our operating costs are gonna be higher, which means we can borrow less debt, which means we can build less housing. That doesn't mean we can't build 68 apartments, but maybe we can only build 60 because if, if, our, if our operating costs are gonna go up, we're gonna build less units because they, I didn't bring the number with me, but I think Bay Ridge Apartments has $2.6 million of debt on it right now. Well, if I have to change this construct and I can't have off, and we can't have offsite net metering, it won't be able to borrow 2.6 million. So that's the ripple effect. And we, we have to talk about the fact that, as I understand it, net metering for single family owner, homeowners is going to continue. And, the, I mean, how can we do that? And and at the preferred rate, not at not at fifteen cents, at seventeen cents. Like, there's over nineteen thousand. I think there's nineteen thousand eight hundred. I'm a numbers nerd. Single family homeowners that are net metered currently, and I'm t we're talking about a pop, about a universe that's you know probably less than. We're not going to net meter every uh, affordable housing apartment in the state. So we're, we're talking about a much smaller subset of that. Which is, um, help me, uh, let me know if, if you disagree with my sense of um, how to bring solar um, to your development. So community solar is one in which your uh, net metering is one that is figured, it's paid by ratepayers, including low income ratepayers. Uh, community solar is one that is paid through grants, uh, through working with power purchasing agreements with the utility, kind of one-off, a um, little bit more uh, fine-tuned in terms of who is paying for that as opposed to other low-income folks. Would you agree that that's the case? I'm not sure I quite followed that. 
that net metering is paid for by low income ratepayers as well. It's paid and by all ratepayers. All ratepayers, including low income yeah. ratepayers. Yeah. And community solar has the ability to be much more finely tuned in terms of who's paying for it. So via grant funding or uh, working through uh, utility programs uh, so that it's not put on rates. I'm not understanding the difference between community solar and I think I, I almost don't want to talk. I don't almost don't, I don't want to call what we're doing community net meter because we are directly, we, we are both the off taker and the producer 100% matched. Um, so I'm still not, I'm still not understanding the difference. Why don't we go on? Yeah. Logan, did you still have a question? I saw That's you next fair. in that statement. Um, I appreciate you bringing up the, um, the fact yeah. that single family home net metering would still be allowed um, and we're getting really approved net metering. So um, if I understand you correctly, you're asking for a carve out for affordable housing development on group net metering? to continue to allow it. Yeah, and I apologize. Um, I've been working with VHFA on some possible language to statutory language, but we can provide that at another time. Representative Stevens. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, you know, my, my major or the, the piece here that really gets me is that um, it is really a once in a lifetime to have the solar for all and the direct pay from the federal government where nonprofits after 20, you know, whatever, 15 years, nonprofits can finally like access the tax credit directly instead of having to go through, you know, someone else who can hold the taxes because that's something that the Inflation Reduction Act did. So I just, I'm just so mindful that, um, you know, we we happen to be entering this opportunity that until effectively like July 2029, because it's a five year when, you know, once a, if VHFA gets this grant or whatnot, they have five years until 2029 to complete all the projects. And, you know, if you pencil that out, if you layer on by, you know, made in America, low income, you can actually get 70 percent of the project costs paid for by the federal government. So I'm just mindful that like, finally, we have something outside of Vermont that can help us. I mean, we all pay into our federal taxes, if you understand my gist. So my question to you is um, sort of uh, working off of the carve out question. Um, and I also am very mindful of the fact that the proposed structure is, you know, um, was carefully balanced by many competing interests how many, how much, how much, um, you know, net metered solar do you think you could build to match your current project pipeline through 2029 so that we really do bring in, I mean, 70% of a project is just. Yeah, well, wow. you're, you're exactly what I'm feeling. It's like we're at this cusp of a moment in time and we've been waiting and we also, in order to decarbonize, it, you know, some of our, if we're going to carbon, carbon, decarbonize our existing housing stock, they can't, some of our buildings can't have solar on the roofs. Right. And we, we, we locate our proper properties, we, our, 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 we locate our properties so that our tenants won't have high transportation costs in places where there's not a lot of excess land. So, so but are you thinking like one megawatt a year? Are yeah, you, I'm are not good at translating okay. dollars to kilowatts. <laughs> uh, maybe you can do that. Um, well, if you think about I, Bay Ridge, that's 150 kW plus. And, yeah, so, and that's 68 apartments. So maybe that's a good example. Like, you know, multi, and, and, you know, that's, a, we've got the rooftop, we've got a 150, and that's 68 apartments. And, um, I can get back. I can. Yeah. I have someone just in my curious. office who who could probably help me with. I'm this. just curious because I do hear also, you know, our our rural utilities. You know, they've got a lot of miles um, and um, of of coverage, and therefore that impacts costs. So I do also hear that. So I'm wondering if there were to be a carve out, what what does that look like to make sure we capitalize on the federal no, that's a good dollars? Question. 
Yeah, I, I'll try to work on that. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for your testimony. We, we uh, represent Smith. I have an easy question. Okay. I think an easy question. Uh, once these units, if and once these units get built, are you limiting rentals to a, a low income, like $40,000 a year or whatever the low income is considered? So we use a program called the Federal Low Income Housing Tax Credit, and it mm -hmm. comes with a lot of rules. And then we layer on both VHFA and VHCB request require us to do permanent affordability. And the I I, I don't want to fall into housing speak. And typically, our units are targeted to sixty percent of median income. And in um, Washington County, wait, I usually have the chart with me. Sixty percent median income is probably under forty thousand. Yeah. What, what can these renters expect to pay for rent? They don't, you? they don't pay more than 30% of their income towards rent. Okay. Yeah, we also have to agree to that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Your um, and I, to, to Representative Stebbins point, even just sort of a, um, I mean, I think we're looking for a kind of a scale thing. It doesn't have to be, we won't hold you to it exactly, but I think we're looking for, what would the impact actually be? Uh, Gus Selig, please join us. We now have um, Gus Selig from the Vermont Housing Conservation Board. Thanks. So for the record, Gus Selig, thank you very much for making time for me. Uh, I'm going to start by saying I am not an energy economist, um, and I can't answer some of the questions that you guys have to wrestle with, um, but I do want to talk a bit of it. And usually when I'm coming in here, I'm in here to share the broad impact of our work on climate, whether it's this week, we're going to close on a farm that's going to be converted back to wetlands. We're working right now in Brattleboro to restore a floodplain at the Sir Sosimo site. Um, we are, um, we, have, we, we do a lot of cleanup of contaminated sites. So lots of the work that you spend time on. And we ask a lot in our housing policies of housing dollars. So we are asking, as Kathy said, for smart growth locations revitalization of downtowns, the cleanup of polluted sites, um, highly efficient buildings. Um, we are asking to serve more and more um, extremely low-income Vermonters and Vermonters who are unhoused. And you are also asked in our statute to consider the opportunity to leverage the state's funds as much as possible. And I think we're moving toward a moment um, where there's going to be a lot less housing dollars available. Um, and I think you want us to continue to build um, the best buildings we can that are going to be carbon free of carbon. Um, we have worked toward those goals throughout my career at DHCD. We wrote our first energy policy with Blair Hamilton back in the late 90s. Um, we and VHFA won a MacArthur grant in 2008, and we went back to VEIC and we updated what we call the Roadmap to Energy Affordability to encourage all of our participants to um, build the most efficient buildings we could. We built, we built the first uh, passive house certified uh, multifamily building in Northern New England in Milton a few years ago. We worked with High Meadows Fund and I see to stand up Vermont. Uh, about a week ago, we took, or three weeks ago, we took delivery on a new product, which is a zero energy ready mobile home out of a manufacturer from New York State. As finally, there's a new standard for mobile homes that's much better than the current standards had been. Um, there are, um, I think, about 26 more homes headed toward Brattleboro to try park to move people out of the floodway. Another way that we're trying to deal always with the climate issue. Can you give us a sense of? I'm just curious about your zero energy mobile home. What the price tag on that is? Uh, it's in the high one. It's around 170. The cost of the home is different from what it takes to actually put it on a lot. Sure. So there's often costs either because there's a wrecked home there uh, that needs to be removed, or the new foundation requirements that HUD gives us. Um, but the cost difference between the zero energy ready home and another home is not uh, not huge significance. I'm told it's a little over twenty thousand dollars. And the one seventy is 
inclusive or just for the unit? And then it's just for the unit, not for the site costs. Thank you. Um, but much so we are looking anywhere and everywhere to stretch our dollars. And I can't quantify, as one of you just asked of Kathy, exactly what the impact will be. But as she said, when we have higher operating costs in any development, um, that means that the project can borrow less money. And it means that for what's called the soft debt lender. So we provide debt to these tax credit deals on a deferred basis and in order to make the deal work. And so the hit on us will go up if the operating costs of a project also go up. So there's a real value. If we wanted to use least cost for building housing uh, and building multifamily housing and smart growth, we wouldn't do smart growth locations. We wouldn't do the most efficient buildings. We would be, as Kathy said, eating with gas and not achieving the goals. And the reason we're doing it is because it's the right thing to do. Um, it's morally important. It's important to our climate, but it doesn't have the quickest back. So um, whether it's the solar for all program or the tax credit program, we want to be able to see our partners leverage this. So the issues that Kathy spoke to a moment ago, I just want to be clear about what our requirements are of the developers we work with who are primarily nonprofit organizations, but fundamentally we are recording in the land records when they get a grant from us or a deferred loan from us, a requirement that they restrict the income of the property that you're investing in on a permanent basis so that it can be continue to be affordable to low and moderate income people. And we're fundamentally restricting what and how it can be sold in the future. So it's not a typical market asset. Um, I do want to say that I am I, I live at the end of the line in Lewis's territory. I am mindful of what the co-ops have done for the state of Vermont. Um, when I first started my first job uh, in Vermont, I was running uh, fuel assistance and weatherization programs for a fellow who was quite named Ben Collins was quite close to um, the Aikens, and I understand the legacy the co-ops give us and and the value that they bring uh, to Vermont. Um, I'm also, um, and this was probably in Avram's time, I called Washington Electric. I do, I am a full disclosure, part of a three family net metered system, which at that time, Wick, the guy at Wick, Bill Powell, a good friend said, oh, I'm so excited you'll be the very first to do this. And he encouraged us to do it. Um, uh, I understand we're in a different time and place in terms of where Vermont is, but I think that, as Kathy said, if somebody with my family's income can benefit from net metering, it seems to me that uh, the Global Warming Solutions Act suggests equitable access. It's for you to figure out the best way to achieve that, but it will be a loss for us. We will produce somewhat less housing. We will have less incentive to ask of developers to build the most efficient buildings if we can't add some subset of multifamily housing, um, which are mostly in downtowns and village centers um, and not have the same impact on our small co-ops that, that will on our larger utilities. Um, so I think that's, um, those are the things I wanted to say to you. I'm happy to answer your questions. I know this is a tough issue. Thank you, that was helpful. Um, Representative Sibelia. Thanks, Gus. Um, I, I'm really struck and thinking about, you know, kind of where we are right now, which feels like really a lot of urgency on a lot of fronts mm -hmm. um, with climate change, um, with our failure to build housing for years and years and years. Um, uh, with opportunity, with all of these federal dollars, and I'm really struck by um, how important it is that we are all working together, and that there is no way for um, really any of these sectors to win. Like, there's going to be wins and losses um, all around. You know, I think about uh, <clears throat> right now, um, 
I believe it's $2 billion that is needed to storm harden our grid uh, because of the weather that we are seeing. Um, and that is particularly necessary in our rural utilities, uh, Kingdom, uh, Central Vermont, uh, you know, GMP's territory. We certainly have seen the effects of climate change, um, you know, last year, this year, with these kind of repeated outages. Um, I know that you all are also feeling the urgency of people don't have homes. Uh, and we have a lot of resources, not a lot of, you know, we've got the workforce issue as well. So along those lines, you know, how, uh, how do you see um, the affordable housers being able to help um, I, uh, with, with, the, with the reliability issue? Um, you know, we're asking the utilities to help on a whole bunch of different issues. Uh, and and um, <clears throat> to add on to that question, I would just say, you know, you've kind of put it on us that we have a bunch of difficult choices. You know, you guys, you guys are the experts. And really what I'm counting on is you all who are really in the weeds on the federal funding that's coming in, what you need. And the utilities who are in the weeds and, and, and industry, you know, so I kind of would turn that back to you, like, help us figure this out. Um, you know, we're not looking at net metering writ large because that's not what's been able to kind of come to the surface here in terms of making incremental progress decarbonization. Uh, I'm happy to work on that as an issue. I have not, VHFA had a representative on the committee that's been working on the renewable energy standard. We were not asked there. I'm happy for us to put some time in. Some of the complications of energy finance is kind of above me, uh, but we have people that we can talk to and we're happy to work on this as an issue. What I do think that, you know, most of you are rightly proud of you know, all that's come from our public policies to push equity to the forefront. And uh, I think all I'm trying to say is a policy that will help somebody with my family's income and much higher who might have a 3,000 square foot home, or 6,000 square foot starter castle, but doesn't help somebody who is living in a 400, 400 square foot studio apartment um, doesn't strike me as yet achieving the equity that we all want to achieve. Um, and I don't have the answer for you today, but I'm happy for VHCB to put some time to that question. I would really appreciate that. So thank you. That's great. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, we're good. Can you can you make it brief? Because very brief. I just want to tell committee members and and Gus that that uh, three home net metering uh, project way back when created some very, very unique and odd regulatory issues for both me and my successor. <laughs> I'm happy to share that with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they did. And I'm sure Bill was completely straightforward when he said, please do this, you'll be the first. All right, thanks again. Um, we're gonna take five minutes. We are reconvening our meeting uh, and welcoming Lewis Porter from Washington Electric Co-op. Great. Back. Thank you for the invite and sorry to not make it last week. I had uh, was ill, so I couldn't make it. So thank you for uh, for allowing me to come in today. I'll try to be short knowing you have a lot of a lot of witnesses, but obviously happy to answer any questions also. Um, Washington Electric is uh, like Vermont Electric Co-op. Washington Electric is a nonprofit utility uh, owned by the people who who uh, pay for the electricity that we provide them. Um, we uh, like VEC. We were founded in 1938. Uh, and after several attempts to get uh, investor-owned utilities to expand in what's now our territory, a group of people got together. And it always is incredible to me that from the first time they got together to found the to 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 start the utility to when the first generator was turned on by Governor Aiken was less than a year. So that they built a utility, strung lines, bought generators, and turned it on in less than a year, which is is always pretty remarkable to me. Uh, right now, we serve uh, 12,000 meters, 12,000 members uh, across the rural parts of 41 towns in the kind of central eastern part of Vermont. Uh, we have enough power lines to stretch from here to the state of Georgia. 
uh, and we have 13 people on our line crew who keep those uh, running. So it's uh, the nature of a rural utility um, anywhere to to be uh, have a lot of miles of line with not a lot of people to pay for it. But but ours is a particularly extreme, uh, particularly extreme case of that. Probably the most rural uh, utility territory in, in the Northeast. We're very proud um, that uh, due to those who, who have been in my job before me, including Representative Pat, um, Washington Electric has also been able to, to become 100% renewable utility and to provide 100% renewable electricity to its members for, for a number of years now. And uh, the, the social and environmental mission of the utility are uh, at least uh, equal for us to the uh, more traditional utility missions of reliable, safe, and, and affordable service. Um, that has been, uh, you know, a very important part of Washington Electric. Remains an important part of uh, of what we do for our membership and for the board of uh, directors that manages that oversees us, um, who are themselves co-op members. So that's sort of who we are in a nutshell. Um, we were part of uh, the Renewable Energy Standard Working Group over the off session. Grateful to be invited to participate there. Uh, a very candid and productive conversation um, occurred, and and I think an important one given the complexity and difficulty of some of the issues that that uh, all utilities face, but but those in in Vermont especially. We support the uh, the agreement, the the kind of framework agreement that came out of that, um, for the simple reason that as a hundred percent renewable utility, we think all Vermonters should have access to a hundred percent renewable power as soon as is practical. Um, and so that's the, I think the, the the top line and most important aspect to that framework is one we're very much in support of. Um, <laughs> at the same time, because the electric sector in Vermont is only responsible for 2% of Vermonters carbon production, uh, we think it's very important to keep uh, an, an eye, keep an, a, a focus on the price of that renewable power at the same time. And the reason for that is not just for the uh, financial well-being of our members, uh, Andrea Cohen was very eloquent on that point, and our we our members have the same uh, concerns, the same issues as as hers in that regard, but also because the transportation and electric sectors in Vermont each contribute thirty six percent, roughly, of Vermonters' carbon load. So the real opportunity here is to electrify heating and transportation, and obviously, price of the electricity that you're charging people is an important component of that. Uh, people are price sensitive, they do pay attention, and they do follow uh, what will be best for their wallets as well as what will be best for the environment. So keeping that price at the uh, most reasonable amount is is an important aspect of that. Um, there are uh, several very important elements of that framework agreement uh, that are that are essential for Washington Electric. I can go into them if you'd like, but I think we're going to talk about the bill. I think the, you know the, we we are supportive of the framework as it exists and want to make sure that those elements end up being reflected in the legislation, as, as I think everybody on that agreement does. I can go into some of those pieces if it would be helpful, or we can talk about it when the bill comes out. That might make might make more sense. Um, but it, very briefly, the uh, the uh, having the Coventry Landfill Gas Plant uh, be and remain renewable is important to us. Our members have invested millions and millions of dollars in building that renewable energy plant. Um, and having the 100% renewable utilities uh, subject to a load growth measure instead of to a base tier two renewability measure is important for us so that we are not in the position of having to sell renewable power that we already have in order to buy new renewable power. So I think it's reasonable and, and a fair approach to have the 100% renewable utilities be obligated to meet a large share uh, of their load growth through renewables rather than have it them be uh, wrapped into the overall percentages as the other utilities are. And don't worry too much about that at that at this point, I'd say we're, we're going to go into the bill in detail and I'm happy to come back and talk about the details of that. But I would just say put that as a as a placeholder for two of the things that are very important to us. Uh, we were glad that the framework agreement includes the uh, elimination sunsetting of uh, group net metering. Um, we feel that net metering uh, reform really needs to go farther than it did in the framework agreement. The nature of a of a 
complicated multi-party agreement is nobody gets everything they want. <laughs> uh, and so I, I recognize that. But I, in the interest of my members and 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 the organization that they own that I work for, I really need to flag that that net metering is uh, a twofold concern for us. One is that cost shift that Andrea talked about from generally weller, uh, more well-off members to lower uh, lower income, less well-off members, and the second is that price that uh, the the increase in the rate of electricity um, that net metering drives. Um, and the difficulty in electrifying heating and, and transportation based on that. Uh, we actually just last night had a, a consultant um, complete an analysis for us of the cost of net metering. And for Washington Electric members in 2023, they paid just a little over a million dollars more than they would have in the absence of net metering. So that's Net metering certainly has a benefit for us. The power, you know, power is good. The savings on transportation and uh, tran uh, transmission costs is good for us. The peak shaving is good for us. So once you take all those benefits into account, Washington Electric members in 2023 paid about a million dollars more than they would have otherwise uh, because of the net metering program. In the scale of things that all of you deal with, uh, a million dollars is not a lot. Um, but remember, that's an annual cost. And for us, that represents about 5.6% on rates um, because we're relatively small. So that's uh, of, of significance to us. I have a quick question then. I know uh, Representative Logan does too. What percent of, of your members have net metering? Just under 10%. And have you uh, gone to the PUC to seek kind of relief from net metering? Well, uh, yeah, yes, in, in several iterations and several different um, rounds, the PUC has uh, slightly decreased the, the price paid for net metering over the years for all the utilities. Um, but there is not a authority or provision for them to provide relief just to Washington Electric, as I understand it. Representative Logan. Thanks, Chair. Um, of that million dollars uh, additional costs for uh, net metering to your uh, customers. What percentage of the net metering cost is for single family homes? In our territory, virtually all of it. We are, we are very heavily over 95% uh, residential load and, and very, very heavily single family homes. Yeah. So not all of it likely, but 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 very close. Senator Sevilla. Thanks. Uh, thanks for your testimony, Lois. <clears throat> Question on Coventry, actually, <clears throat> um, and potential expansion in the future. Um, is there a way for an expansion to be done in a way that with increased efficiency at the plant? Or would it only be at the same level of efficiency? I this is a question that's been posed to me. Yeah, and it's one I've thought about and done some research on. I, the The answer is it's not a simple yes or no. There are certainly ways to build the plant that would operate more efficiently, but those would be at significantly higher cost. So I would say I think even at its current efficiency level, the plant should be considered renewable because the nature of the methane produced in the landfill is otherwise it gets flared. And either way, it's putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And the, the fact that that's the way a landfill gas plant works, to my mind, argues that it should be efficient, should be considered renewable, even at the current levels of efficiency. There would, uh, I, I expect there would be a way to build such a plant using, say, a gas turbine engine, something like that, instead of a, uh, you know, an internal combustion engine. They might operate at a at a more efficient level, but I think the expense of building and operating it would be significantly higher. One more question, thank you. One more question. Um, it would be great to know if you have some range actually on that. That's not my question. Um, happy to follow up offline with you on that. Uh, there's been described a phenomenon that I still have a hard time kind of grappling with when uh, because of the prevalence of net metering in WEC territory. Um, an effect that happens when the sun shines. And if you can help me understand how that translates to rates. Yeah. Okay. Great, great question. So 
the basic, the, the, the simplest way to describe it is because net metering in our territory is almost exclusively solar, it produces all at the same time. And those times are not when the peak usage in our territory is. So at three o'clock on an August afternoon, you are getting a lot of solar production. You're not having a, a peak load in our territory. We, we are a winter evening peaking utility. Uh, and and the, the challenge of that is twofold. One is on the electric supply, it doesn't match up well with the load. And so that increased costs. The other, um, I'll call it physical effect of that is that you are uh, putting strain and jeopardy on the physical infrastructure of the grid because the mat, the load and the production are not matched up well. And so that causes us and requires us to, re, to rebuild and upgrade physical infrastructure that is then paid for by our members, borrowed through this federal government at very good rates. Uh, thank you very much, federal government. Um, but uh, but is uh, paid ultimately. Those loans are paid by the members to do those upgrades. Am I answering your question? You did. Thank you. What one more? Oh, sorry. Representative Smith. Uh, I do. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. In Coventry, uh, they're burning a lot of methane that is not being produced. Is not producing power. I don't know about a lot. There are times where due to our equipment having maintenance issues or a, the amount of production or for other, other issues, they are flaring sometimes. Yep. Is there enough there to build another generator to produce more power? There will be within the next 10 years enough to, to add um, engines to our plant or to, or to build another smaller plant, but probably adding engines to our plant. Our plant our plant's five huge Caterpillar diesels mm -hmm. that burn methane. Beautiful. And it's amazing. I mean, for somebody who's in who, who's interested in mechanics and engineering, it's an amazing sight to behold. Uh, but but yes, there would be enough to expand that plant. The challenge will be because it's in the Shi'ai region and because it's in this transmission constrained region, there are some challenges in terms of getting that power out to where it's mm -hmm. being used. So we would probably want to do that in conjunction with a battery system at the Coventry plant so we could load that at periods where the transmission constraint is great and discharge it when it's not. But but the short answer is yes, there will be enough methane at that at that facility to expand. Um, but there are other uses for methane as well. There are plants, there are landfills that bottle that methane, truck it and use it as uh, as a natural gas, a renewable natural gas. So there are other usage for uses for that as well. I have one more question. Is that all right? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> recently, uh, I'm, I'm driving home from it. I'm driving on 91, and I never smelled methane before or whatever that is. I don't think it's garbage. It's, 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 I think it's methane that they're burning. Uh, and that's probably two and a half miles from the dump as the crow flies. Uh, is that what I'm smelling is what they're burning? You you're probably smelling uncombusted methane. Now I don't want to I don't want to I want to be careful here not to go into my partner Casella's part of the operation too sure. much. So just take this for <laughs> what it's worth uh, uh, an an ignorant electrical utility person talking about a landfill but there are there are a variety of things that can cause short-term uh, issues where the methane may not be captured or may not be burnt efficient, efficiently particularly in the winter. Um, the freezing thawing temperatures can pop the, the tops off the wells. Casella is extremely efficient and effective at getting out there and fixing that. But there are times where uh, sometimes there's methane that, that, that might uh, escape in small amounts. Thank you. Okay. Representative Sibet, very quickly uh, follow up <clears throat> on uh, expansion with a battery and the question around efficiency. And I I mean, this is probably a larger conversation, um, but just around batteries and, and what what makes something more efficient? I mean, it seems to me that if you're a battery it might be making something more. Well, I, it's it's all I mean, you, you you all deal with definitions, legal definitions every day. So I, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. It's all in how you define it. I would agree that it's more efficient use to combine these things, whether it's net metering or whether it's a Coventry plant with a battery. Mm -hmm. It's not actually increasing the combustion efficiency of the engines. 
Um, but but yes, and 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 uh, to somebody's question uh, about federal money, uh, Vermont, the, all the utilities in the state, including us, put in for a grant last year to uh, try to get some federal money to um, build utility scale batteries. Mm -hmm. um, it was. Uh, I thought it was kind of a remarkable project because you had municipality, municipal electric companies, uh, Velco, the transmission uh, utility, you had co-ops and you had the IOU, Green Mountain, and you had the state of Vermont all participating in a grant application. We didn't get that grant. We didn't receive that grant application. I think there was about a 20% success rate nationwide on those, and, and we didn't get that one. We are resubmitting that again, updating it based on the feedback we got. And so, you know, knock wood. Um, Washington Electric certainly needs to install utility scale batteries at its substations uh, within the next decade. Uh, and we need to do that both for economic reasons uh, and also for uh, to help deal with this uh, excess production of solar when when all the net metering systems are, are on. Thank you for your testimony. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Uh, I, I appreciate it. And I appreciate the chance to weigh in a little bit on net metering, knowing that that's not really the core of this agreement. But I do think it's important that we keep an eye on it. Thanks. Next up, we have Vanessa Rule from 350. Oh, good morning. Thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, my name is Vanessa Rule. I'm the lead organizer and the co-director of 350 Vermont. I first wanna thank you for your service. The more I learn about how Vermont's uh, legislature works, the more I appreciate how arduous your task is. Um, and so I wanna thank you for your hard work. I'm here testifying on behalf of thousands of Vermonters who volunteer with and support the work of 350 Vermont. Our mission is to build a people-powered and people-led climate justice movement for a just and, and thriving world. And we are here to work with you and to help you do this job. In addition to our regular membership and our volunteer electricity and campaign teams, I'm here representing the 166 people who signed up to take action after attending one of our 11 Empower Vermont events this fall. These events were designed to give attendees the opportunity to understand where our electricity comes from and why our renewable energy standard needs updating. Most were shocked to find out that the majority of Vermont's so-called renewable electricity does little to reduce carbon emissions. At the end of the presentations, attendees often express anger at the current system and a feeling of inspiration to change it. They translated their outrage and hope into action. They reached out to many of you, made public comments at the legislative working group meetings, attended DPS events, and wrote letters to the editor. They showed that there is political will, public support in Vermont for updating the res, so that it will work to deliver more just and low emissions electricity. 350 Vermont is highly supportive of revising the renewable energy standard. We support the creation of tier 1A regional uh, new renewables and increasing tier two requirements in state new uh, renewables in the proposed bill. This increases the amount for low emissions electricity, that's solar and wind, by 10% by 2032 to between 30 and 40% by 2030, 2035, depending on the utility's respective goals. We understand the significance of the compromise reached between the utilities and the environmental groups at the table. This makes it much more likely that Governor Scott won't veto the bill and that you would have the numbers to override a veto if he did. We understand that you're working within the bounds of what's politically possible currently. And as you know, you pro despite these efforts, 40% is not enough. <clears throat> when I and many others involved in Thrift.org movement started advocating uh, for elected officials to act on climate in 2007, my children were three and six years old. I learned then that the maximum safe amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is 350 parts per million, hence 350.org and 350 Vermont. Do you know at what level of parts per million human life on earth evolved? Any of you? 270, 270 parts per million. Today we're at over 420 parts per million. That's 20% higher 
than the maximum safe amount level and rising faster than ever. The heat we're feeling today is the result of emissions from 30 years ago. With what's in the atmosphere now, plus all we continue to add year after year, warming will continue to accelerate and, Vermont, and the Vermont our children inherit will look nothing like where we live today. I read in Bill McKibben's Earth, that's Earth with two A's in 2010, about how wildfire storms and droughts would wreak havoc by washing out our roads, by making it harder to grow food, by displacing people and by, increase, by increasing geopolitical conflicts, harming the most those who had done the least to cause the problem. It's 2024 and we're starting to see the true impacts of climate change. And this is only the tip of the iceberg unless we take action that is proportional to the crisis. This summer, I lay awake most of the night during the July storm that put this town, Montpelier, underwater. I heard the unrelenting, pounding rain, feeling the full wrath of our planet, and wondering if we could, in fact, do anything to avert, to avert total climate catastrophe. And I asked myself, what will the storms, droughts, and fires look like in Vermont five to 10 years from now? What happens if we don't do enough to stop this? The thing is, we know that later is too late. We know that. Now is the time. Our communities, our children, our planet need us to get to 100% low emissions renewable, that's solar and wind, as quickly as possible to protect them from runaway climate change. So 40% is not enough, but it's an important start. We need your commitment to an aggressive and ongoing revision of the renewable energy standard moving forward to reach 100% low emissions renewables as quickly as possible. And we also understand that our electricity sector needs to be affordable and reliable. The good news is that this transition to 100% low emissions electricity is increasingly feasible. The cost of solar and wind is dropping. They're not cheaper than coal and nuclear. Battery storage technology improves by leaps and bounds every day. The need for mining rare metals is decreasing thanks to new minerals, uh, to new materials and recycling. And the vast majority of people want leaders to act. So here are four <laughs> things we ask you to do to get us on the right track. First, we need you to be honest about how much this bill will actually reduce emissions. Renewable energy is not necessarily low emissions. The claim is that this bill gets us from 75 to 100% renewable energy. The public and many elected officials have been misled into believing that our electricity is cleaner than it is. This has made it harder to get public and political support for cleaning it up. The science and research tells us that large hydropower, the use of unbundled renewable energy credits, biomass and renewable natural gas emit significant greenhouse gas emissions. They have no place as a solution in a bill whose purpose is to address climate change. The current bill still allows for a 20% increase from large hydropower, more unbundled renewable energy credits, biomass, and RNG under tier one. That means 20 more percent emissions from flooding indigenous lands in Quebec from burning gas, wood, or new RNG. We can't power our homes by producing more trash. The, the methane that's being produced by these landfills shouldn't be in the trash. It should, the, the, it should be composted. We shouldn't have material that produces methane in landfills. Our second ask is, instead of leaving this 20% under tier one, we ask you to increase tier 1A and tier two requirements from 40 to 60% by 2030, so that the 20% is guaranteed to come from solar and wind. We understand that current Hydro-Quebec contracts will be online through 2038, and we're not asking you to touch these. Third, the proposal, the proposed bill eliminates group, ne group net metering. Um, I want to echo uh, the testimony you saw from housing advocates, affordable housing advocates today. Um, if group net metering is going to be eliminated, an alternative and viable path for affordable community solar needs to be put in place. Many Vermonters, including affordable housing advocates, support and will champion community-owned solar. And some of those same people will oppose utility-owned solar in their communities. 
Vermonters are a proud self-reliant people and are culturally much more likely to embrace new solar if they own it. As we electrify everything, this bill sets the electric utilities as the sole source of monopoly for our full range of energy needs. Consumer choice is eliminated as the products become more and more essential. <clears throat> we need consumer choice. <clears throat> and the beautiful thing is that today's technology allows this. We should be encouraging community solar, not creating bigger and bigger obstacles. Uh, 350 Vermont has also been organizing conversations about solar inciting in order to find ways to meet the need for increasing solar while protecting agricultural lands, open space, and biodiversity. We believe this energy transition will be much more feasible if Vermonters have a say and agency over what it looks like. Finally, there are two companion bills that would increase the likelihood of passing the res and make it more achievable. The first, as was already mentioned today, is the rate protection, um, the rate payer protection bill sponsored by uh, Representative Stebbins, which will lay the groundwork for a bill in 2025 to protect low and middle income rate payers. Rate payer protection is essential, even now, as low income families spend over five times more of their monthly income on energy bills than higher income families. And as we consider cost, we need to ask ourselves what's the cost? of transitioning to solar and wind compared to the cost of the current cl recurrent climate catastrophes. How much did the July storm cost for Vermonters financially, physically, emotionally? What was the cost of the people whose homes and farms were destroyed? What about the cost to those who couldn't make it to work? To the healthcare workers working overtime with that extra compensation? How often will this kind of storm happen moving forward? How do these costs compare to the cost of investing in a low in a resilient, low emissions and reliable grid. The second bill is the Thermal Energy Networks Bill co-sponsored by Representative Torre and Cordes. It would decrease the electricity demand from air source heat pumps and our need to burn carbon-based fuels to heat buildings. Thermal energy networks could be owned by municipalities. Vermonters want more energy choices at their disposal to actively support and participate in this energy transition we literally need to put more power in the hands of the people. And what about jobs? There are so many jobs to be gained from this transition. Solar and wind energy jobs have steadily decreased since the renewable energy standard was passed in 2017. You can turn that around. Finally, we want to raise the concern about the disproportionate voice the utilities have in this process especially as they, as they claim to be 100% renewable, which um, we know is not low emissions and is not helping our climate. We're grateful for their work keeping the lights on and understand that we need to work with them through this, this transition, particularly the people who work um, for the utilities. We appreciate that they came to the table to reach a compromise, but we need to acknowledge that our biggest utility is accountable to shareholder profits first and that they're part of an industry that has systematically and intentionally slowed progress on climate because this energy transition threatens their bottom line, including by threatening rate increases. We ask you to keep this in mind as you consider what you do this session. Whose interests are you hearing the loudest? Who stands to benefit or lose? What do Vermonters really want? And finally, what's at stake? Thank you for tackling this most important and challenging task. You and Governor Scott are the people in the state currently with the most power to improve the lives of those disproportionately impacted by the production and burning of carbon-based fuels and by climate change. And you and Governor Scott hold our children and our planet's future in your hands. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Representative Sebelia. Thank you. Vanessa, for your testimony. A uh, question about um, some of your testimony having to do with monopolies and competition. Um, are you arguing for deregulation of the electric sector? I'm just saying that it needs to be um, shared, not just it, we need to be on the utilities, but that we need community on solar. So we need more regulated utilities is what you're arguing for? Um, I don't know how to answer that question. So I need to think about it. Okay. So yeah. thanks for asking the question. When, when you're talking about monopolies, yeah. 
and about utilities, you know, I, I start thinking about um, the other parallel for me is the telecommunications sector. Um, and um, you, know, you can be regulated by government or you can be regulated by the market. Uh, right. And what what I was starting to hear you say is deregulation, which is regulated by the market, which feels very, yeah, very not, dangerous. We're not advocating for that at all. Um, we're just saying that um, we're putting energy production increasingly in the hands of the utilities by getting rid of community solar and, and um, yeah, and the right for people to own, you know, group net metering um, community solar in their communities. And who has responsibility for um, the poles and wires, the transmission, um, all of that? Well, I'm assuming it would be a collaborative effort. I mean, I live in Stratford right now. We have a community-owned solar project of the road that 32 households have invested in. Um, you know, we're plugged into the grid, but um, we're getting um, we're getting payback for the, the the money that we invested. So this is an advocacy for group net metering mm -hmm. as opposed to community solar. Well, both and we need to be. Well, they're different. So okay. I guess I'm not an expert on all of these issues. I work with uh, an electricity team that um, are policy experts, and we would be glad to get back to you on that and any other technical question. One other question on the methane issues that you brought up around um, commentary and mm -hmm. HQ. Uh, yeah. So <clears throat> we have, I mean, we have, a, we have mm -hmm. methane that's being released now. Right. No, so we're not saying, so we shouldn't be adding new methane. We shouldn't be banking <clears throat> on landfills to expand. We don't want new renewable natural gas. Um, the gas that's being captured at Coventry and used is fine. Um, it is better than it being flared into the atmosphere. Uh, we shouldn't be transporting renewable natural gas because it will leak um, out of trucks, out of pipes um, in through transportation. Um, but the idea that we might, Create more opportunities to um, generate renewable natural gas to power our um, buildings is is really not the right way to go. And you know the fact that we call it renewable, um, there's nothing renewable about um, you know taking resources and throwing them away um, instead of recycling them. So a lot of what's creating the methane in landfills is um, biological matter that shouldn't be in landfills in the, in the first place. They should be going back into the soil and sequestering carbon. It's a request, not a question. I would love to hear more about how community solar is being set or how I'm happy to talk to you all. But, well, my sense is it's harder to build community solar with that group net metering. That's my understanding. Representative Stevens. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, thanks for your testimony. Um, I heard from a constituent that emailed me that said a decade ago, the Vermont legislature passed 10 BSA 582 little g and directed a &R to draft rules around carbon inventory within one year. a &R has still not drafted these rules. Uh, so my question to you is, you know, your first comment was be honest about what this bill will, will really do. Um, so do you have recommended changes to how 10 VSA 582G is currently written so that we capture things differently? Or is it more that we need to say, hey, it's been 10 years, can we draft the rules? I think we need to draft the rules. I mean, I, I, I again, I would need to go back to my team. I fully expected that. Um, so you can get back to me. Yeah. But um, I think that's a good question, and I think we need to be exploring all the avenues that we have um, to really fix that, because it's really misleading. Thanks. Thank you again for your testimony. Thanks. Okay. We will welcome Annette Smith on the Zoom from Vermonters for a Clean Environment. Welcome, Annette. Thank you. My name is Annette Smith. I'm executive director of Vermonters for a Clean Environment, and I thank the committee for inviting me to testify today. Okay. Okay. 
My work for the last 25 years has been at the tail end of the policies enacted by this legislature, in which we work with Vermonters to enable them to have a say in what goes on in our communities and, a, and to have a voice in regulatory processes. I participated in the Department of Public Services Renewable Energy uh, Standard Stakeholder Advisory Group this summer and watched most of the legislative res meetings. What is the purpose of the Renewable Energy Standard? As we heard in the Legislative Res Committee, as expressed by Lewis Porter of Washington Electric, the purpose of the res is to reduce emissions in the electric sector. It is therefore appropriate to provide some context. Well, that's interesting. Never used this program before, and it's not working. Okay. Hmm. Let's just try something else. Don't you love technology? <laughs> Yesterday I had to testify in uh, in Senate Finance, and my internet went out for two hours right before it was supposed to happen. All right, well, I'll try this again. Globally, here is a depiction of CO2 emissions in the six largest economies. During the same time period, the United States has reduced emissions, while China and India have greatly increased emissions. Why? Coal generation. Coal consumption in Asia has skyrocketed while it has declined in North America. In December, India announced it plans to double its coal production. Nationally, Vermont has the lowest CO2 emissions of any state in the country, and all the numbers are, are here. I'm, uh, it, it, I have submitted this presentation. You can look at it larger. and Vermont is among the lowest per capita emission states. I hope you will keep the global and national emissions context in mind as you consider the costs and benefits of revising Vermont's renewable energy standard to require utility portfolios to contract for more renewable energy and require more in-state renewable energy to be built. In the global context, Vermont's emissions are minuscule. In the national context, they are very, very small. How much should ratepayers pay to reduce Vermont's already low emissions? Is the <clears throat> the right priority at this moment in time? On the state level, the electric grid for distributed generation consists of municipal cooperative and investor-owned utilities. Green Mountain Power serves the largest territory and customers. Its distributed generation map provides a view of the challenges the state faces in providing equitable access to locally distributed electricity. Some areas have plenty of capaci capacity, while others have less than zero. And I'm sure the other utilities have similar maps like this. And we're not talking about how we're going to upgrade all of this distribution system. Access to three-phase power is limited. In my local area, it is only available along Route 7. Well, there are a lot of us who live over here. No doubt, most of the other utilities in the state have similar challenges building out distributed generation throughout their service territories with the possible exception of Burlington Electric Department. Think of this as equivalent to the challenge of building out fiber optic cable, where some areas got it a decade ago while some are just now being served. What is the cost of deploying locally distributed generation equitably throughout Vermont? This means upgrading power lines, transformers, and substations, plus updated service to the home. Is this additional cost incorporated into the res model? As someone who thinks I have a lot of capacity for energy policy, I will share with you that I find this topic to be enormously complicated. If you are not well-versed in the discount rate and the social cost of carbon, it is easy to get lost. Models are inherently going to be wrong. I was glad to see part of the stakeholder advisory group or be a part of the stakeholder advisory group so that I got a front row seat into the details of the modeling, which was then used by the legislative committee's consultants. 
Overall, my experience was that the modeling results were not preserved, presented in a way that the average person could understand and therefore obscured important details that became better understood because we were able to ask questions. In an effort to simplify what I learned, I will focus on three topics. Benefits and cost modeling, land use, and ratepayer costs. How were the benefits and costs determined? I think that the model overestimates the benefits and underestimates the cost. Sorry, this isn't bigger, but I'm not going to go try and make it bigger and lose the ability to continue. Can you just, just zoom in on your screen? And, and, Maybe that'll work. And now, members. Boy, there you go. Yeah, Good I do. Right. Have, it is also available online under Annette's name. Yes, it is. This slide is from the first draft made available from SEA, the consultant, to the stakeholder advisory group. In reviewing the potential benefits, it's important to understand that some of these are regional benefits, and as such, only 4% accrue to Vermont. Land use costs are not monetized and therefore unvalued. Because I am aware of environmental issues that have arisen from constructing wind and solar projects in Vermont, such as problems building solar on wetlands, clearing forests for solar and wind, high elevation stormwater problems, I delve further into the identification of environmental impacts as a benefit. I learned that benefit is based on a potential reduction in groundwater use for a fossil fuel plant. This presumed benefit would not occur in Vermont, and therefore, Vermont would receive only 4% of that benefit. I supplied further information to the consultant in an effort to bring a real-world Vermont assessment into the model, and my understanding is that the Agency of Natural Resources did also. However, the model is based on data, and as such, it could quantify gallons of water consumption reduced by not using a fossil fuel plant, but could not incorporate damage to Vermont's wetlands or streams as a result of renewable energy development. And I just happened to find the New Yorker has a... a a piece on modeling uh, that I put a link to in my written testimony. It's It gives a good uh, review of modeling and uh, about mathematicians. Also not quantified are societal costs, some of which we have seen in Vermont are serious when it comes to wind and solar energy development, such as property devaluation. Health effects from sleep disruption due to wind turbine noise are not considered. I did bring it up and ask that it be considered. As such, the model is very general, regional, and contains biases that exclude the specific issues we have experienced in Vermont regarding the impacts to the environment and the people who live here. The proposal to increase tier two from 10% to 30% by 2030 or 2035 raises questions about land use impacts and the process by which we cite locally distributed generation. According to the Department of Public Service, the current tier two at 10% requires 25 to 30 acres of land developed for solar annually. The model estimates about 2,200 acres through 2035, depending on the scenario chosen. A 30% increase in tier two could re require 200 acres per year to be devoted to solar over the next 11 years through 2035. For context, Vermont's standard offer program required 127.5 megawatts over 14 years. Assuming five acres per megawatt, that means 25 acres per year. Tier two at 30% requirement could require nearly 10 times more land for solar development annually. What we have not seen is the baseline. How much land has been converted to solar in Vermont to date? In the eight years from 2016 to 2023, since the res was first adopted, how much acreage has been used for solar? And that includes ancillary areas and not just the footprint of the array itself. I've asked DPS and ANR and they do not have answers. I do not know that anyone has kept track of total acreage devoted to solar development in Vermont. This is a foundational question that should be known before choosing to devote more than 2000 acres to solar development in Vermont over the next decade. Because of our terrain and topography and competing land uses, use needs, Vermont has limitations on development. Lots of rock, water, wetlands, steep slopes, an agricultural economy, forests, especially value, uh, valuable to address climate change, housing development, tourism, commercial and industrial uses compete for limited available buildable land. This is a fact we all need to recognize. 
As you heard from Jonathan Thompson of Harvard Forest in his presentation of the report Growing Solar Protecting Nature, it is possible to do a strategic evaluation of what has happened to date and prioritize future development. We have not done that work in Vermont. Why not? Perhaps in part, it is due to the shift in focus to emissions reductions of Vermont's environmental groups who participated in the legislative res committee, but did not bring up environmental or land use issues. Those groups do not participate in the process of citing new renewable energy in Vermont with one exception. This has left a big vacuum in the state regarding environmental impacts of locally distributed energy. If Vermont continues along the current path, we will see more haphazard development driven by developers choosing the cheapest sites close to transmission lines, but not necessarily where they would be most beneficial from a utility or community perspective. We will see inequity as areas of the state with grid capacity are favored over those in need, in need um, of expensive upgrades. We will see conflicts and efforts to reduce or eliminate public participation in the PUC process in order to build as much solar and wind energy as fast as possible. As I asked in public comment to the Legislative Res Committee, is updating the res the right conversation to be having at this time? It's evident that that from the testimony you're hearing that lots of people are working on developing renewable energy in Vermont. I'm not sure anybody needs incentives. When are we gonna talk about siting renewable energy projects and create incentives for siting on the built landscape and disincentives for building on natural and working lands as recommended by the Mass Audubon Harvard Forest Report? I suggest now is the right time. To my third point, what is the cost of the res as it exists now? What is the cost of the res under the different models? This slide from the res technical analysis report RIM focuses exclusively on items impacting Vermont bills. All scenarios modeled yield net increases to Vermont ratepayers under every scenario modeled. The cost of the current res is about 15.5 million. So that's added on to what uh, ratepayers would pay instead. And this is only a very small part of the cost uh, estimates which go out. And, and you can see the business as usual is increasing uh, over time. And then every model has different increases. Rate impacts will increase over time. Uh, some utilities recently have requested five and 8% uh, rate increases. Vermont Electric just filed for 8.7%. Burlington Electric just filed for 5%. Uh, th these rate increases that you are proposing to uh, create by adding uh, more requirements in the res are on top of that. Given the rising cost of so many aspects of Vermonters' lives right now, is this the right time to add more financial burden to Vermonters by increasing electric rates? Since the passage of the Global Warming Solutions Act, Vermont has invested many millions of dollars focused on emissions reductions. Is there a cap on how much can be extracted from taxpayers and ratepayers? I leave you with this final image taken from a proposed scenic viewing tower location on Mount Anthony and Bennington. At the tip of the Bennington Battle Mar Monument here, is a forested area that has been the subject of extensive litigation over the siting of two contiguous two megawatt standard offer solar projects that began in 2013. One of the projects was denied twice by the PUC and is back for a third time. The other project's denial was just upheld by the Vermont Supreme Court, but the developer will probably petition again for another one. The developer currently has five lawsuits in federal court, four against the PUC and one against the town of Bennington. The town has been sued twice, and the governor, ANR, and VTrans have also been sued. This is the picture of solar development in Vermont. When are we going to talk about how to change our system to avoid these types of conflicts? VCE recommends that now is the time to do the work to protect nature and engage our communities and encourage solar development in locations that make sense from multiple perspectives. Now is not the time to enact, enact more requirements to build more renewable energy in Vermont and let developers choose the technologies and locations without consideration of how it affects the cost of living for people and the cost to our natural and working lands and the scenic natural beauty of Vermont. Thank you. Happy to answer questions. Thank you for your testimony. Um, do members have questions? 
Representative Tory. I just have a comment, um, Annette. I appreciate your attention to the modeling um, and also your reference to the Massachusetts report. Um, so I was thinking the same thing. I would really like to see a map like that for Vermont. And I, I, as I think we're hearing, and I've felt for quite a while that we we need a complete revision of, of standard offer net metering. The the, the energy policies that we've had uh, that now's the time to to do it. And it's been fascinating to listen to the testimony this morning and hear so much of it focused on net metering and not about res at all. I just I, I'm glad to hear the conversation shifting, and I hope that you will continue in that realm because that really is is what's needed. And if you want to look more at net metering, take a look at what's happening in California. Uh, you might want to get Mary Powell to come in and talk to you about what she's dealing with out there with Sunrun. Um, it's it's a big story. It was in the New York Times the other day. There are other states that are making changes to their programs. Everybody's dealing with these same challenges. People want more renewable energy. We just need to, to reconfigure the way we do it so that we can do it better. Do you have a question? Just I wanted to follow up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to to also mention um, your testimony made me think about how with the costs and that modeling graph that you shared, you know, there's a lot of other um, movements and changes coming in the energy transition that are going to affect what we pay for electricity and how the electricity we produce is valued. There's a lot of movement on that. So I, I think in some ways, um, tackling what you're suggesting now could be a, just a little bit premature. Um, and I think focusing on the good work that was done this summer um, is probably enough for, for right now. But I, I do, there is a lot there's a lot here. It's a very complex sector and um, a lot of opportunity to have a much more holistic uh, look at, at how we uh, use and produce energy in the state. On the, the comment about premature, I'm reading about something I've been hearing about for a long time, which is thin film solar. Well, the Japanese and the Chinese are competing right now to bring it to market in the next couple of years. And if that happens, that's a total game changer, depending mm -hmm. on the cost. So... This this whole conversation about citing silicon panels may may become moot if this technology becomes cost effective and gets out there. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I guess in follow up, I appreciate that your uh, attempt, your mod, you know, kind of talking about the land use and identifying, which I have also identified, the fact that no one's tracking how much solar uh, we have now and where it is. And I guess I'm curious, is there a jurisdiction that you're aware of that's doing a great job balancing all these competing needs? Well, as you saw with Vermont Electric Co-op, they've taken their own approach to serving their, their customers. Um, and and I think they, 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 they are a good model. You know, people, I was on Vermont Public Radio, Vermont Edition, a few years ago, and I was asked, well, can you identify any good solar sites, you know, any that you'd like? And I was kind of stumped. I mean, I like some of the landfill sites, but on the other hand, uh, the wrecks are sold out of state. I mean, that's a whole other part of the problem is that you can't point to any of the big wind projects or any of the the uh, big solar projects and say that they are renewable energy for Vermonters. And I understand that's one of the things that this proposes to change, but it also is one of the reasons for the rate increases is, is uh, allowing the big wind projects to uh, retire the wrecks. And that turned out in the questioning on the res model to be one of the major cost drivers. Um, <clears throat> I mean, the companies that are doing these, uh, that are driving the siting, they may be, some of them may be Vermont companies, but then the, follow the money, which nobody's done. Um, and you end up with, uh, that, for instance, one company, a couple of companies that I've noticed are bundling their their net meter projects, and then they sell them to investment banks. My impression is that, in, and a lot of the solar projects that are built are going to, you know, in Citibank, Morgan Stanley, investment banks. So, how how do we how do we, how do we evaluate what's good when we don't really have 
uh, an understanding of the financial side of it. And so there's the siting issues, there's the financial issues, there's the, is it renewable energy for Vermonters? Is it really, you know, doing what we want it to do? So, you know, I, I see a lot of bad sites. I don't, I don't hear about sites that are good because people don't come to Vermonters for a clean environment with, with, uh, problems with good siting. They do come to us when they feel that there should have been notification they didn't get. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm struggling to answer your question, Madam Chair, because um, the whole the whole process for developing solar is not working on so many levels. And you know, aside from what, for instance, the Vermont Electric Co-op is doing to serve their members with solar, um, I don't know. And, and on net metering, I mean, I'm off grid, so I can't bank my credits. You know, winter, I'm running a gasoline generator. That's actually how renewable energy works. You know, when, when you have the, the winter peak, you're, you have to get electricity somewhere. This idea that we're going to get it all from wind and solar and some backup hydro. I mean, we are not, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm sorry to say this is not politically correct. We are not going to get off fossil fuels. Not with the technologies we have now. They are going to be an important part of the energy mix. And nobody wants to say that. But I will you know, step up and say that's part of what it's like when you live with a renewable energy system. So the net metering program that's letting people generate excess electricity in the summer and get credit for it in the winter, that's not how renewable energy works. I did find that Rhode Island has a cap on how much you can net meter uh, and you can't overbuild so that you can earn more credits and, and game the net metering system. There's a, there are a lot of issues with these topics. And, and I, I also want to say to this committee, I appreciate all that you have been given. And I've been looking at the structural changes in the uh, these legislative committees. And it used to be that House Natural and, and Energy was the jurisdiction over policy, but then the committee that had the jurisdiction over the money part of it and the, the PUC was House Commerce. My very first testimony in this, in this legislature 24 years ago was before House Commerce on a proposal about Section 248. And so when the House... Uh, Technology and Energy Committee was created, that took away the jurisdiction over the money part of it to and gave that to House uh, Energy and Technology, which I was supportive of because, um, and, and there was a, a, you know, a chair who was in the financial business. But now with the elimination of that committee and joining energy technology, and I gather you have jurisdiction over the PUC and money, uh, plus natural resources, fish and wildlife, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the, the structural changes in the legislature and how we've kind of, in a way, lost that second look at the policies that come out, which, and this still exists in the, in the Senate, has uh, Senate Natural and Energy can come up with policies, but then they go to Senate Finance. And I see a lot of changes that happen there because of money. So I just offer that observation over time. Nice. Thank you again for your testimony. Thank you. All right. Members, we're going to take five minutes and uh, then change topics. We are reconvening this meeting of the House Environment and Energy Committee and shifting gears to hear from the Agency of Commerce and Community Development on their designations report. Thank you. Well, we're waiting for the slide to go up. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak on this uh, summer of engagement um, on the, the designation 2020 report and process. Um, for the record, my name is Chris. I'm the Director of Community Planning and Revitalization, and I work at the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, and I'm joined by... I'm Jacob Emmerich, a Public Policy Manager with the uh, Department of Housing and Community Development. I think many of you know us, but a little bit more about, you know, where we work in, in state government. Um, you know, we, we are a very small team, um, but we have deep partnerships across state government. Many of our agency partners, you know, they jokingly, you know, B-Trans works in their lanes, but so does ANR, um, so does AHS, so does the Public Service Department, and even emergency management. And so much of our work is intersectional. You know, we, 
are focused on land use and land use touches all these agencies. So a lot of what we do and, and the programs we minister are pretty broad and diverse, um, but they all kind of connect these different agencies to build stronger and vital communities. And some examples of the programs that we run are, we run an um, electric vehicle charging station grant program. Um, we administer programs that um, improve the vitality of communities and walkability of communities with sidewalks and trail networks. We help communities with sewer and water systems and clean water systems. Um, we, of course, being the commerce agency, we support local economic development. Um, but we also do um, work in the housing space. We're working hard on projects to support infill housing and smart growth housing in the right locations. And really, I think, you know, the focus of this session and really something that we've been working on very long, and I think the chair knows this, is um, community resilience. How do we make sure that our communities that have been on the landscape for a long time um, can be prepared for an unpredictable future? Um, it's an eclectic mix of programs, but it keeps it fun. Um, and it keeps it interesting. I didn't, I've been working for the state for over 20 years. I never thought I would, <laughs> but because it always is changing, I think it's very interesting. And the challenges never seem to stop as I'm sure you know. Um, we are here to talk about this report. <laughs> um, it was a huge effort. Um, this is on your website. Um, and also on your website, um, we've got, I know nobody really probably wants to read that many pages, um, we've got a, a one-page overview, a two-page overview, and an eight-page executive summary, and these are all on your website. Um, and we've brought paper copies of them as well. I know that's sometimes frowned upon, but it may be helpful in this instance. Um, I'm just going to... What's, what's a... You just, just pass. keep them organized. You can send them one way. Okay, yeah. We'll just send it there. Um, yeah, let's skip, I think we'll skip a few slides. Um, um, we couldn't have, oh, I'm sorry. This was a huge endeavor um, for us. Um, and we couldn't have done it without the help from a lot of folks. As I mentioned, a lot of our partners were integral to this process, um, state agency partners, um, but also external partners. Um, our housing partners, our community development partners, all across the board um, played a role <laughs> in shaping these recommendations that we're here to talk to you about today. Um, huge thanks to our consultants. Um, we hired a firm out of Washington, D.C. called Smart Growth America. Um, their mission and focus is on smart growth and land use, and they were a huge asset to us. And our assistance for the engagement process was a group called um, Community Workshop. They're uh, um, based in Bethel, and they really did a fantastic job kind of hearing from a lot of people in a very short amount of time. So I know our timeline's compressed and um, we're going to, I just need some direction from you. I was going to just focus on engagement and evaluation, kind of table setting, and then Jacob was going to talk about the recommendations. But I don't know if we can do that all in 45 minutes. Um, really? <laughs> There's a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that, you know, definitely set the table. I don't know that we need to know every intricacy of yeah. our outreach. Okay. And then we'd go to the take home. I can try to just do it quick. I mean, mostly, <clears throat> mostly the, the point I want to make on the engagement is we heard from a lot of people. Um, the direction that this committee gave us was seen in the recommendations that legislative direct um, this committee gave us, is seen in the recommendations and finds up fairly well with what you absolutely want and need. Um, I will be prompt and quick. I think since we don't have a lot of time, if you have questions, I can answer them another time, but maybe just hold them just so we can just blitz through this. Um, the key thing that we heard is um, communities need housing, <clears throat> communities need, need climate and flood resi resilience, and they need livability action now. And Vermonters, and I think the Speaker of the House are counting on this committee to find solutions. Um, about 68% of our cities and towns have one of these designations, and there's five of them. We can go into those in a little bit. Um, and we learned through our surveys, focus groups, and other public engagement that communities really do value these programs. Next slide. And while hundreds of stakeholders say the programs are really valued, they find them hard to access. <laughs> they, they find them hard to access and use. And while many cities and towns have used the program to great benefits, we've got examples all over the state of large and small communities, many communities are left behind. 
Laura, this is for you. <laughs> um, the designations, generally, we found that they have great potential, um, but communities really need more impactful benefits for, to meet this moment. Um, I just, as I said, um, briefly, we're going to talk about the outreach. Heard from a lot of Vermonters. I would imagine that the people who are aware of the designation programs are a very select subset of Vermonters. So did you target them? Or are you just like blanketed random Vermonters about the designation program? Um, it was targeted. Um, we had a group of like key advisors, you know, who had, um, you know, their constituencies and their channels to work out and kind of pass out our surveys and engagement forms and, and get, gather information from them. <clears throat> but I, I would say the key audience for this designation program is municipalities. And I think we heard from well over 130 of them about what's working and what's not working from them. But another key consideration- them through their select board, their planning commission, their staff. Various, there was so many different channels for them. There were surveys, there were focus group meetings. But directly to those people. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think over 500 people kind of directly weighed in in one shape, way or another into this conversation. Just to skip forward, um... mm -hmm. We do have an engagement at a glance slide mm -hmm. that, uh, that talks about all the different outreach that was done, but mm -hmm. a lot of the a lot of the audience what um, focused on municipal officials. Do you have stats of those like who those? We do. We have an engagement report. We didn't. That's a pretty dry report, but we're happy to share it with you. Um, you mean to interrupt? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. okay. So you're back here. Yeah, I'm kind of back there. Um, um, so thanks with your support and with the General Assembly support, you know, this was a $150,000 project. Um, so it was big. Um, 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 you gave us a very specific task in the legislation to look at place-based, um, location-based um, jurisdiction, economic development, and these intentionally aligned with the scopes of the other related studies. Um, um, it was a really hard process because many of us <laughs> during the process got COVID and then there was the summer of floods. So that delayed us. We did submit our final report to the General Assembly last Friday. It was 15 days late, but we did get it done. So that was a big relief. So thank you all for your support. Um, about 250 downtowns and village centers um, are participating in the program. They adopt the Vermont landscape. These are kind of compact and special places critical to our culture, history, brand, and economy. Interestingly, about 69% of Vermonters live within or very close to one of these designated centers. Um, and investing in these centers um, are really important because they have so many co-benefits and they impact so many of our state goals at once from housing access to smart growth, to racial equity, to environmental protection, flood resilience, walkability, livability, economic development, public health and energy efficiency, and more. Um, this is kind of municipalities in these centers is where kind of all the policies that you make and the other committees make kind of have to come together and kind of figure out how it's going to play out in the land. Um, this was a really compressed process. Um, everybody jokes that they say things are a marathon and not a sprint. Well, this was a sprint, not a marathon. We had about six months to get a whole lot of work done. We analyzed existing data. Many of these programs have been on the books for 25 years. Um, we looked at existing conditions and land use, housing hazards, and more. We gathered input from 120 communities, four states, 250 organizations and entities. We hosted 14 events and focus groups with nearly 500 registrations. Um, we conducted five surveys, um, live event polls, um, with nearly 400,000, oh, not 400,000, <laughs> I wish, 400,000 <laughs> responses. Um, we also looked at other states and kind of how they kind of skin the cat on smart growth and how do you, how do you create these strong vital communities. And no response, Vermont is unique. Um, midway through the process, you know, the summer floods happened and with special thanks to the Agency of Natural Resources, we got additional funds to expand the scope and we are working on very specific climate adaption resilience recommendations related to our centers. Those were on a slower boat, but those recommendations will be completed by the end of January. So we'll get you those when they are done. Um, we also met weekly with our partners who are working on concurrent, concurrent reports. So we worked with the RPCs and you've heard about their report. We also met, met um, I would say bi-weekly 
with the RPCs and the NRB. Um, it was a very collaborative process and we all kind of, thanks to you, we, we knew what we were trying to achieve and we worked together very efficiently and collaboratively to get there. All the reports I think are integrated and intended to be delivered as a package. Um, this is the stakeholder summary. Um, um, we've had an excellent event. Um, um, several of your members attended. Um, you, uh, um, Representative Sakowitz was there, uh, Representative Sibelia was there. It was a day long event. We really drew a diverse crowd of people for a day long summit. It's really hard for people to give up their time, but we, about 130 people showed up and it was pretty diverse. Everything from BNRC to VPIRG, the Vermont Climate Office to VHCB, VHFA, a lot of Vermont planners, a lot of municipalities, realtors, and the Vermont chambers. Um, so it was a really fantastic day. We got a lot of great input on kind of how do we make these programs better. Um, we asked people at the, that day to work on these, I call them haikus to Vermont futures, Vermont's future, these six word statements. Um, um, and we got over 200 of these. And from these, we kind of merged them together to create kind of a vision for what communities in the state should should work toward to kind of making sure these centers stay vital and strong. Um, and these, this is a word cloud of these visions. So these are the key words, no surprise. I think we've seen them all before. Um, um, these were compiled into a vision for designation 2050. Um, probably don't need to read it to you, but I'll give you a moment to read it. Um, but we envision, you know, a unique, vital and resilient communities where everyone has an opportunity to thrive in the background. These are samples of these six word visions that were compiled. And in the next slide, you'll see additional, you know, these were kind of poignant, interesting kind of statements um, about where communities and our partners would like the state to be. Um, these were kind of compiled um, based on the feedback and kind of how do we, you know, what did we hear from communities? Um, and the recommendations are we need to make these programs easier and more accessible so more communities can participate in the programs. We need to do a better job aligning state and partner resources to help communities. And for our smaller communities in particular, we need to increase the benefits and technical assistance we provide um, to them to ensure that they can participate. Um, what communities wanted was everything. <laughs> um, you know, the gamut from housing to infrastructure, more staff and capacity, climate resilience, um, livable amenities, uh, and they want a nice community, a nice community to visit and enjoy. And they wanted overall vibrancy. So no surprise the community's list of wants were long. Um, um, the, there's very high participation in these programs. Um, and for you, Laura, especially our smallest villages, you know, we've got um, a ton of communities who are in this program. And there's been a growing interest in the neighborhood designation program. Um, that program has really grown thanks to changes this committee's made, um, making the program a little bit easier to uh, for smaller communities in particular. Um, but the, what they're really interested in is, you know, the the tax credits that help fix up existing buildings, the Act 250 relief for housing within these centers, and the technical assistance from the state. These all got high marks as the highest benefits. Um, some areas for um, improvement. Um, the programs were laid out, five programs over 25 years for different times and different purposes. They're complex. Um, these create administrative burdens for the state, for DHCB, us, and also municipalities. And you'll hear from Jacob in a little bit. What we're trying to do is kind of just make it easier. Um, we want people to participate in these programs. We want people to take advantage of these programs. But right now, it's usually the smaller and more sophisticated communities that know how to pull the levers, who know how to access government, who are really maximizing the benefits of these programs. And they're seeing the rewards, but we want to make sure that the program is open and more broadly available to all communities. Representative Stebbin. Thank you. Did you say smaller? Okay. Um, Sorry, smaller like population, smaller density, smaller. Um, smaller, like, you know, people, you know, need to make things happen. You know, we provide resources and benefits, but we need to be able to work with local volunteers in many instances who can make these things happen. And our smaller communities, while they're, they're tightly knit and more cohesive, they don't have the capacity or so you're saying they aren't getting 
they are gay. Okay, I thought you said they I were. Thought it's I may have. Like you. Okay, they that's were. why. I, okay, you said uh, the smaller ones were participating. Okay. They're, they're, that. they're in the program, but are they accessing all the benefits? <clears> of the <throat> distinction that I maybe modeled. Okay. Um, 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 and there are a lot of opportunities um, to make the programs easier. Um, we would like to make it simpler. We'd like them to focus on key priorities and the report recommends, in fact, reducing the number of programs. Um, we'd like to clarify the goals and focus on things like vibrant commerce, housing and climate resilience, because these are the things that communities really want. Um, and to deepen the impact, um, we need stronger coordination and more strategic investments in community development across our sister agencies and also with our external partners and private investors <clears throat> to replace places both ready for homes, commerce, and the extreme weather that we're experiencing. The challenge is, no surprise, nothing new here, um, scarcity of time and money, um, and especially for the projects that need to be supported locally. If there's not somebody there to champion, it's really hard for our programs to be successful. Um, the complex state systems that don't always work together, complex state interests, local interests, not always coming together. Um, and it makes it really, really hard to meet I kind of have a one size all program that meets the diverse needs of all these different communities. But we do have a plan to make it better. And at this point, I think I'm going to hand it off to Jacob, who's going to tell you about what the report recommends, how we strengthen these programs, and how we work together to align kind of our funding with our regulatory incentives, because regulatory alignment alone is not going to build the communities. You need the financial piece there to really make it work. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, Churchill, for the opportunity to come today. Um, so the reform priorities that emerged from all the, the summer of outreach and all the feedback we heard, not only from municipal officials, we did have wider, wider audience in the outreach than just that, but they are the primary program users, is that there's a, there's a continued commitment to Vermont's goal of historic centers and our development patterns, especially growing housing and climate preparedness in our centers, a continued focus on livable, vibrant, mixed-use development. Um, that helps support cost-effective public services, so for, uh, affordability, urgent needs like housing equity across communities, from small communities like uh, <clears throat> Concord to our largest communities like Burlington, um, er and infrastructure investments, and a focus on building capacity and coordination across governments, across state agencies, across governments uh, to solve solvable problems. Uh, so. Smart Growth America uh, posted all this data and work, working with our uh, stakeholders uh, developed um, some recommendations. And uh, the, recommendation, the recommendations in this report relate closely to uh, what you're gonna hear, or I probably have already heard some, uh, from the Regional Future Land Use Mapping Report and the Act 250 reports. And all of these reports have location-based components to guide state inve investments and regulations in ways that makes life in Vermont more livable and affordable. Some key recommendations include simpler designations, as Chris mentioned, less burdensome administrative and governance processes associated with the, the designations, better benefits and support uh, to solve um, what are local priorities and accessible information and promotion and monitoring. So this is how the recommendations are broken down in the report and the executive summary. Uh, so taking a closer look, you can see this is this is a quite a big undertaking uh, for the state and, for, and particularly for program administra administrators. Um, but, and there are many details in the full report. So the first phase of, of, of a, a potential shift is a focus on building the framework for a simpler designation, smoother administrative systems um, for, for, um, for the designations. And over time, we hope to add new benefits uh, that meet communities' needs. So what do we mean when we say uh, simpler designations? SGA's first recommendation uh, is to simplify into one program built around core village and downtown areas with flexible options for centers and neighborhoods to access goals uh, that deliver on community priorities. Uh, so how does that work? The reform recommendation would take the five existing designations and essentially create two, two base designations, a core designation like a downtown or village to anchor 
uh, the program a surrounding neighborhood as an add-on designation, as well as a pathway to access additional regulatory recognition by Act 250 and other state agencies through a development ready add-on. Um, and that would occur as an overlay within the core and the neighborhood. Uh, so the core designation that maintains Vermont's commitment to villages and downtowns as mixed use centers and hubs and creates one entry point from the smallest village to step up and access benefit, benefits right for them to the largest downtowns. The consolidation is designed to support communities, um, commu their develop local development goals and meet them where they are in terms of local capacity. Um, so the boundaries for these areas would be prepared by the regional planning commissions and their member municipalities and approved region wide. That would just be a huge simplification of the process where a uh, program staff and the downtown board spend an enormous amount of time designation by designation uh, discussing boundaries. So this would be one, uh, one map for the region uh, using a consistent statewide methodology. The add-on neighborhood designation uh, maintains Vermont commitments to recognizing those areas around civic and commercial centers like our current growth centers and yeah. neighborhood development areas. And these would also be derived from regional maps and have a key focus on home development and compact neighborhoods that are climate resilient. Uh, last, the report uh, recommends a separate add-on designation that could overlay the cores and neighborhoods. Uh, for regulatory recognition by Act 250 or other state regulators. Core neighborhood benefits will help communities meet program requirements and build, <clears throat> build investments in a local plan planning framework to make them ready for a development ready area with predictable outcomes. So instead of approval by the downtown board, this would be a uh, track for approval with the natural resources board. And it corresponds a lot with the tier one concept that's in the Natural Resources Board <clears throat> report. So process. Um, the approach would simplify the process for the state and municipalities by moving from the program with five designations with distinct requirements, renewals, and tedious mapping into one-time designation process that can be done region-wide among the 11 regional planning commissions, elevating the value of consistent regional future land use maps prepared with their member municipalities. Uh, we recognize that moving into this new framework uh, is a system change that's going to take time. Um, and municipalities are watching us and you closely to make sure that they don't lose existing benefits and that there's a pathway. For Our goal at the department is to ensure that all existing designated areas get recognized in the new framework and see no loss of current benefits during the transition. We estimate that that could take a two to three years just to get the future um, of the regional uh, mapping in place. And at the same time, DHCD would be working on program accessibility, guidelines, marketing, measurement, uh, trying to find uh, pathways to new benefits with our sister agencies and technical assistance delivery models um, that, that have a real impact on what the state says are its priorities. The report also makes um, recommendations on administration and governance. So right now the, the designation program is steered by the downtown board. Um, this, the report recommends a more streamlined process through the regional approvals um, with flexible entry points and evolved downtown board that spends less time looking at boundaries and more time building interagency coordination and impact for growth uh, with, with uh, additional diversity on the board. These changes would shift how people uh, spend time interacting with the program, especially the department. For example, we would spend less time on program administration and application review, and more on working directly with communities on program development, on technical assistance to move projects along, whether that be improving a town green, working on uh, land use, integrated land use planning with uh, decentralized wastewater, or uh, complete streets and traffic calming. All of those, those are the things that we can spend more time doing uh, through interagency technical assistance delivery. <clears throat> RPCs would also have a more formal role and a much more um, important role in regional mapping. And the locals would spend less time uh, just doing the paperwork to get in the program and more time interfacing with the benefits. So uh, that takes us to the benefits. So the last, uh, the report recommends bigger budgets and partnerships and envisions new technical assistance delivery models. 
Uh, the current benefits are grouped into financial, uh, regulatory, and other options like tax credits, like state granting priority, like uh, the priority housing project recognition with an Act 250. And it's going to take some time to work um, out the, the, the details of, um, which can begin this session, but some of the bigger system change, the, the new benefits that can really leverage uh, interagency um, buy-in especially in times when there are budget scarcity, uh, the designation serves as a platform for strategic and coordinated investment. Um, and money follows readiness. And what the designation program has, has proven um, is that it's a platform for government cooperation and inter interagency coordination and making hard to do projects possible uh, by, connecting, uh, by connecting the dots. So um, just in terms of um, I'm going to skip just in the interest of time to um, how these, how this report interacts with the future land use report and the Act 250 modernization because they're all location based and place based. And so we put this isn't in the, uh, the Smart Growth America report because we're trying to bridge uh, and explain how how our report interacts with the Regents report and Act 250 modernization. But you can see here that uh, downtowns and villages and planned growth areas are uh, as well as um, village, village areas with lower resource, uh, smaller communities are where the designation program interacts. The, the regional future land use maps would uh, interact with the Act 250 modernization recommendations across their tiers. Um, and, uh, and really the blue areas are the plan growth areas that are where you're seeing in those reports recommendations for uh, Act 250 uh, recognition. Um, and so in the future regional land use uh, proposal, you see the plan growth area is defined as an area served by water and wastewater, uh, local land use and development regulations, multimodal transportation and complete streets. In the designation report, um, these are areas that would be within cores or neighborhood and in within a regional planning area with a local framework for growth and development that can work with both the, the regional concept and the Act 250 concept of tier one a and tier 1b exempt areas where there's water and wastewater or soil treatment capacity, local land use and development regulations, and uh, an administrative capacity. One thing we didn't coordinate, though, in the, these reports was naming. So you see different names in all these reports. So we're using it. We're hoping that this is a helpful guide to, uh, um, to that sort of a glossary <clears throat> understanding those reports. I jokingly call it the, the Rosetta Stone. So if you want to know what the different report they're all largely talking about the same things but the terminology and their slight nuances and changes between the two and oh my god we did it we yeah. told you six months worth of work in uh 15 or 20 minutes um um there's a lot more in the report there's things that we didn't get to in the interest of time um we still have a fair amount yeah. of time yeah i think they're less price i mean there was a there's a whole bunch of recommendations around better marketing of the program, mm -hmm. um, better coordination, you know, getting the word out to communities. Like we've had these designation programs forever, but people don't know what they are, you know, and it doesn't have a name that kind of like gels with people. Um, so, you know, once we had our framework and benefits better aligned, um, really working to get the word out to communities. There's also a bunch of recommendations around better measurement of our progress, you know, um, um, we have a statewide land use goal to support compact settlements surrounded by rural countryside. Um, the designation program um, is really an aid to that goal, but it's not solely responsible to that goal because really on the bigger picture, it doesn't make a huge amount of investments to actually kind of move the needle to make sure that all growth happens in these tidy, tidy areas. Um, but we do think... Um, you know, we'd like to be able to monitor and check and see how things are going, but there's a lot of frustrations with you know, statewide data collection and gathering and capacity to actually monitor. Um, but those were key recommendations. That, and, and I think it's something that we do need to do, but it's, it's hard for us to do without additional staff and capacity. Um, um, I think those were the two primarily, primary kind of uh, recommendations that we skipped was marketing and measurement. Um, Okay, but I think like you flew through some of your slides, so I, I would like to go back to some of them. Um, there's one administration and governance shifting mm -hmm. roles. Uh, maybe walk us through that. Like, I'm, I guess I'm really wanting to understand um, how 
you're envisioning the role, I mean, you know, historically the designations were very much focused on what we like to say, um, the tax kind of benefits, the tax incentive programs. You shared with us other benefits or things that you're working actively with communities on, which excites me. I mean, I, 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 I was uh, struck by the shifting role of the downtown board and in really supporting technical assistance to communities, theme we're hearing this session, um, and in doing those things that meet our, our other goals, besides sort of the land use regulation buckets, but making our towns more vital so that people want to be in them yes. as your role. And I think that's great. And so I want to understand that complementary role to the other things that we've been talking about. And I think that starts here. And if it's, mm -hmm. yeah, so I'll let you address that. Um, governance, we spend, like as Vicar mentioned, we spend a lot of time, you know, picking, deciding what part of the community is in and out of the boundary. Um, it's not a good use of time. Um, I think the Regional Planning Commission's helped many of our communities do this work already, create these maps already. If we could just delegate this to them and do it all at once, it would save our member communities a lot of time. It would save the RPCs time and it would save us time um, to really focus on the things that matter, like getting projects scoped and developed and in the ground. Um, other governance changes that come to mind, um, the downtown board right now is, is comprised of uh, agency secretaries or their designees. Um, this recommendation envisions elevating it back to the secretaries because we want to create that intersectional leadership platform to re be able to you know, figure out how VTRANS, ANR, and uh, PSD, you know, how all these programs can align to create the outcomes that are needed in communities. Um, it happens to a limited extent now. Um, but oftentimes, you know, for instance, um, um, you know, Secretary Moore is our designee. She appoints Billy Coster. Billy Coster is a great person, knows the nuts and bolts of the program, but he's not the decision maker on how programs are prioritized and how they're administered. Um, so I think that's a, a potential a huge opportunity for us to really elevate the effectiveness of the programs, fully engaging the, the agency secretaries. Our, Governance also, um, the board was created many, many years ago with small changes. Um, there's no um, there's no DEI membership. So we'd really like to see somebody from the Office of Racial Equity be a member of our board to make sure that our decisions um, are thought of more holistically. Um, other thoughts on Jacob? Yeah, I think uh, one of the ways that when a community is interested in, in designation, they'll reach out to us. And beyond a village designation, there's quite a few requirements. We go to the community and we walk them through the require, requirements. Sometimes they require that they need to do a specific area improvement plan or they need to do some bylaw updates. And so they're in a grant cycle and they're getting ready for an application. They do the application and then they come to the downtown board. The downtown board spends time reviewing the staff report, reviewing the boundaries. Um, and then there's a check-in every four years because there are eight-year designations. And then there's a renewal process every eight years. And the municipalities are often having to collect data and, and, and do this. What the, the shift of the governance uh, by moving more decision-making to the regional future land use map does is it just recognizes these are intrinsically valuable areas and that there are certain conditions in place, uh, whether it be infrastructure or local planning, to recognize them in our regional maps as uh, places where we want to invest, where we want to grow, and where it makes sense to grow. And so uh, that shift, what that does is it allows uh, uh, more municipalities to so-called be part of the, uh, at the designation uh, program and begin to access benefits and incrementally uh, get the grants and work on community developments that meet their needs without a higher barrier to entry. So. What's happening is, is that the regions are recognizing these areas, and then the communities then can access benefits to the projects that they want to do. And our staff time and municipal staff time is then freed up to be focused on projects yeah. and not being uh, not so much program administration. So that's that's a big, big shift in the program. And I guess the yeah, related point is, you know, right now um, the designations. Give a nod 
to local and regional planning, um, but they're not an integral part of it. And I think the same is true of Act 250, as you know. You know, there's a recognition of regional plans in one of the criteria, but it's it's not driven by kind of a map that identifies where we want to focus development, where we want to make these investments, where we want to make regulatory ease more possible, and where do we want to um, you know, do more environmental protection. I think making that clear um, across the state with consistency through this regional process is going to be an amazing tool over time to really help us focus on what matters. Thanks. Representative Stem. A little bit of a shift from the designation report update, but you mm -hmm. mentioned mm -hmm. um, you could do more if you, mm -hmm. right? not that we have any budget mm -hmm. issues going on, but you mentioned that you could do more mm -hmm. if you have more staff. We had a bill introduced yesterday that proposed, uh, if I recall correctly, 1.5 million mm -hmm. to assist ACCD to assist municipalities. Uh, and then also within that to provide more support mm -hmm. to RPCs for their, you know, so they could have more staff. Mm -hmm. And then also in that bill, and I might be characterizing it slightly off, but you get the point. Mm -hmm. Also in the point, also in the bill is $125,000 to go to ACCD for a position to do more. Um, and then there's another $125,000 uh, proposed for a, a different place I mean, a &R. A &R. wonder what your I thoughts are on i guess sorry to butt in i'm curious if you're familiar with the bills uh, is this rep dolan's bill yes. yeah yeah I'm, i've read it quickly somewhat familiar um um you know we have a small team we're eight people and we have um three limited service positions so we um try to do a lot for a lot of people with a very small amount of people um, I think all those decisions about staffing and positions or, you know, they're, we're waiting on the governor's office <laughs> to figure out what their budget priorities are. I think all agencies could do more with more people, um, but we have to work within what the governor's directing us to do. So. Actually, Representative Satkowitz and then Bob Burns. <clears throat> so um, this proposal would give the RPC some additional responsibilities. Uh, but I also thought, think I heard you say that there would be some efficiencies that they'd be able to gain in the process also. So are you envisioning sort of a, a net, sort of no net difference in sort of the overall level of staff time we would expect from them when they're interfacing with these programs? That's, my, that's our hope, our belief, because right now these are one-off decisions that we make. We designate one community at a time. The RPCs have done a lot of work in their regional plans. We make a pretty significant investment in regional plans. They have future land use maps already. I think you heard from the RPCs last week, but just with some cons efforts on consistency and working um, you know, with their member municipalities, um, we could take something that they do already and map it to this other, so to speak, to this other purpose. And I think that will be a huge savings in time. Uh, we'll approve regions at a time. So, you know, potentially, you know, 50 to 100 communities at once um, rather than one off. So I think that will save a lot of time. Um, being the gatekeeper, while it's valuable to have the state oversight, and that's still envisioned in this process, it does just take a, it's a lot of time. And as Jacob mentioned, we'd much rather help communities do these projects and make some things happen rather than doing the process. Representative Bongards. Uh, two, two things, one very quick. Um, if you mentioned three limited service uh, positions, how long do they last? That's a great question. Um, uh, you had them. Uh, well, we've, we've had them um, for maybe, I think I'm gonna say two years, um, but it's, it, it's been incredibly challenging to recruit people during the pandemic. So some have been filled and then some have gone vacant. So there's not been a consistent uh, capacity within our division. Um, many of the ARPA positions, I think, expire in 2025, I think, and I think they're all slated to quit that. In fact, down to eight. Yeah. Um, or five. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. okay. Eight included the three. So you'd be back down to five. Okay. Um, so just to make sure we are all on the same page about how this all fits together, because uh, you, you talked about that. So if I, I just want to try to articulate this and see if I think I have it right. Uh, so we have the 
both the NRB report and your report <clears throat> really shift in some ways the way we do business by really having it start with the future land use maps and giving a much bigger role in that in that um, town and region working out what's where and the, the designated depth. So the, the parts of the designated downtown program that you looked at back on the governance slide. Part about the, the core and the NDA using a different term now, right? Neighborhoods, yeah. yeah. So that would be based on first on the future land use maps. Then they would apply to the board you're not talking about making some changes to those two levels of designation, right? And then the third level of designation, if you will, I'm just using my own language here, um, which would involve regulatory relief, would be applied for. You'd have to have that core first through your board, but then then the town would apply, town and region would apply to the whatever board we end up calling with the current NRB um, for the regulatory relief in some portion of that area that those two put together, right? So there's a, okay, so it's a really, it's all dependent on future land use maps. You do the first level, but then in order to gain the regulatory relief, that's a separate process to the, okay, yeah. And what this addresses is, I think this committee is well known, the designation programs, <clears throat> became the kind of a proxy area for, for Act 250 relief <clears throat> um, um, because we could never get any agreement. <laughs> so one of, if I can go, can I go one more? Um, what portion of this, you talked about this taking years to unfold, what portion of this is particularly valuable or in your view needs to get in place this year <clears throat> doing our work? Um, our goal is, you know, if, uh, we need to get the mapping process rolling because that's, as you noted, is drives all the other pieces. So without that, we're kind of blind. Um, we would like to get the basic designation, revised designation framework passed. Um, um, it will take us time to develop you know, new applications, new guidelines, new process for how communities apply, for how the, how, how the process works. Um, that will take probably several years to implement. But, you know, if, if anything is possible, getting the framework passed this year that sets us up for future work or reporting back as you see fit on how this is implemented is what we need. And I, I think you know, um, you know, Representative Bongars has a bill, um, H683, um, that kind of lays out this basic framework. So how do we, how do we, how would we envision implementing this? Um, I guess I'm kind of curious about back to the better benefits offering slide, which is 38. Um, the assistance, you have, you have current benefits, 20 plus assistance options, and then it's consolidated into something called review and improve, which I'm not quite sure about. I'd like to know what you mean by that in the slide. And then is there in this large report an outline of these current benefits, or not an outline, but actual in-depth, like what are they? Yes. And then, okay, great. And so can you just tell me what does review and improve mean on this slide? I'm on, sorry, I'm on a different slide. Um, yeah, that one, renew and, renew and improve. Other lower right-hand corner. I'll review and improve. Uh, there's 20 plus assistance and then it sugars off to re review and approve, which I just need an interpretation. Yeah, so my understanding of that would be, um, and it goes back to, you may remember the last uh, prior years we brought the table mm -hmm. requirements and benefits and uh, we actually, we took out that slide, we shouldn't have, but, <laughs> but, um, but there are, uh, maybe 20 different benefits programs. Most of them are financial or regulatory, but then there are other assistance like uh, direct, uh, a direct visit from the downtown coordinator to the downtown, to, to 23 downtown organizations. Um, so uh, this is an opportunity with the shift to think about how those types of uh, small, smaller ancillary benefits 
uh, can best deploy to meet housing needs, to meet their climate challenges, to meet um, uh, 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 to meet the infrastructure needs of communities. Is that is that? It's your, it's your, I don't know. It's your yeah. slide. Yeah. Yeah. I have no idea what it yeah. says. Um, <laughs> Sorry. You know, my response does yeah. that answer yeah. your question. So, it, that, not. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love the reference into in this in the report. Yeah. Yeah. We, the slide you left out, perhaps, is that in the report or um, we have a much, much longer slide deck. And I think uh, we tried to truncate quickly beforehand because our time got shut shut down. So, so was this slide deck used where what was this? The longer one was set up for who? The longer one we presented it to our advisor group. Um, so we had a group of about um, say about 20 different stakeholders. Um, was presented to them in December. This was the right track, wrong track on the report and final recommendations. Um, I had a consultant. Yes. Okay. All right, further questions? Um, sure, this is the beginning of a conversation. So we hope so. Thank you for being flexible <laughs> on our timing today and um, for doing all this work um, at a sprint and not as a marathon. And, uh, Thank you for your support. And if there's additional questions, we'll, um, I, I think we'll give you the full, more comprehensive slide deck for you to review. And if you have more questions, you know how to find us. So thank you for your time. Members, before we go, before we adjourn, I just want to say that I'm, um, Gabrielle's provided me a draft letter, um, PAA that I'm gonna read and then expect to see that coming up in uh, for a group conversation here. If I can find it in my, Yes. <laughs> um, and then continuing thoughts on bills that we may move to other committees that we went through yesterday. My inclination is to move a couple of those. Um, but I haven't finished my thinking on it. <laughs> and if you have, again, I'm open to your input on it. We'll talk about that. Perhaps we have some time this afternoon. And other public service announcements that you look like you might want to share something. Uh, Barb Neal. 911. I wonder if we should hear on that. The for BAA. Tomorrow. No, for today. For BAA. Oh, today. Okay. So they have, um, I don't think Maria is available, but we're just getting a run through of what that is. Okay. And so here's why we'll be because we're going to get the other funding bills. Okay. Oh. All right. With that, I'm not seeing any comments from you all. We will adjourn for lunch.